It is uh, two o'clock, sorry, two o'clock UK time, uh, three o'clock Budapest time. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Karim Jemam. I'm from the School of Computing at the University of Leeds in the UK. And it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to this uh, Heterogeneity Alliance workshop. Uh, for your information, uh, this workshop has been running since uh, 2018 at high peak. And it's basically a workshop that brings together any, uh, anyone with, with interest in hardware and software heterogeneity at large. So uh, maybe we can start uh, very quickly. I'm going to give you a brief introduction about five minutes on where we are with the actual heterogeneity alliance. Uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah. Uh, can I guess you can see my screen now? Yes? Should I, yes, should I yes, yes, we can. Yes. <laughs> Hello, right. So uh, very quickly, uh, again, uh, my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Heterogeneity Alliance. This is, uh, uh, the Alliance is somehow uh, uh, managed by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Clara Pezuela from Atos uh, in Spain. And, uh, and basically, uh, the, the whole idea was that um, this alliance was uh, officially, uh, uh, I would say, started in 2017 as part of an EU project at that time called Tango. And uh, its official launch uh, uh, took place in uh, January 2018 at uh, Manchester as part of High Peak. And again, the whole vision is, 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 to, is to look at heterogeneity from the perspective of the hardware or the software or anything else, but hopefully uh, with the aim to simplifying and optimizing heterogeneity. So we have as a, as a research community to pursue this common objective within this alliance and, and potentially influence and develop the heterogeneous market itself. So at the end of the day, uh, if you, this slide is still very relevant because of the concept of the heterogeneity and how do we see it. We saw a large number of applications, usually disruptive applications, such as uh, cyber physical systems or cyber physical systems of systems, the Internet of Things, HPC wearable computing, that, are, that will certainly need to, be, uh, to run on some form of uh, hardware uh, environment. The hardware environment itself is by definition uh, heterogeneous, but before we get to the hardware, these applications also tend to run on uh, heterogeneous platforms. It could be an HPC environment, it could be your mobile phone, it could be a grid, an old grid for those who still remember grids, a cluster or potentially a cloud. Now, going to the uh, hardware itself, we can see a proliferation of, of CPUs, of DSPs, of multi-core, many-core GPUs, FPGAs. These days, a lot of interest on multi-FPGAs. And it is clear that there is a need to, to, to design more flexible uh, software abstractions, potentially improve system architecture in order to really to exploit the full benefits offered not only by the applications themselves, but also the platforms and the heterogeneous architecture where they actually run. So uh, the Heterogeneity Alliance came with this just general vision where you could see a lot of diverse applications taking again advantage of the heterogeneity of the hardware. But again, what would be the best path to get from the application to the hardware itself? So you are familiar certainly with this model, which has been uh, certainly uh, uh, clearly uh, um, uh, used and, and, and reused in, in the past, certainly in, in various initiatives and projects. That's what we call the hourglass model. You would like really to keep the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I would say, what is in between the application and the hardware to the minimum and hopefully aim for the maximum. In the sense you would like to do the minimum in order to ensure that the maximum number of applications would benefit from this. So we had to start by defining a component architecture, which we did. And one aspect of the alliance was to have a software repository where uh, we, uh, were, and certainly a repository and certainly in tools in order to uh, uh, allow anyone who has some form of solution, some form of tool to, to provide 
to the community to be able again to make it available to the to the benefit of all. So, uh, in terms of uh, the, the 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 approach that we have taken in terms of, of the overall research is 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 to look at the application life cycle from the application design, the application construction, deployment, and the operation. And what was so interesting is that we had on board. Uh, not only the software engineers, we had the programming model people, we had the middleware people, we had the hardware people, the virtualization people, anyone who has again an interest in this heterogeneity actually came on board. From there, we moved into a, a more formal way of, of working and we, 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 we put in place a number of working groups, uh, such as uh, uh, the those interested in IDE uh, SDK, the middleware, runtime and systems and the heterogeneous hardware. We're looking at these four main groups, we realized that we could actually do better because you could have a vertical interest in exploiting the heterogeneity within these working groups, but, but looking, for example, at the aspect of real time, the aspect of HPC, the aspect of embedded systems, and the aspect of the more general architectures and, 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 and platforms, for example, clouds and, and edge computing. So, we ended up again with eight, uh, with eight working groups, again, uh, in place that will look again at, at, at exploiting a top-down uh, architecture in the context of this heterogeneity. Okay? So other aspects that, of, of course, will be of interest to everyone will be, the, will, will, be se will be security, energy efficiency, performance, and the rest. But again, we will expect that all these will be not only vertical, but also uh, uh, horizontally, uh, uh, horizontally addressed. So the Alliance itself has now a large number of academic and industry uh, partners. Uh, we have uh, the last statistics about 30 partners so far. We have an architecture in place with its layer and dimensions. We have the working groups in place. We have a catalog and tools already in place. And again, if you go to the uh, website of the, the, of the Alliance, you should be able to do a search, for example, if you are looking at a, at a programming model or if you're looking at a scheduler or you're looking at some form of uh, 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 hardware device management tool. We have a book uh, that was already published uh, uh, in 2019. We have a second book in preparation. We also have, um, uh, a manifesto uh, uh, research uh, paper that very much looks at current uh, trends and also the research agenda in terms of heterogeneity for the next five, 10 years. Okay, so this uh, paper has been submitted to the ACM computing surveys and is currently uh, uh, being, uh, being uh, resubmitted after uh, we received uh, uh, reviews uh, from, the, uh, from the actual journal. So that's very much what I had to say as a general introduction uh, to this. And uh, the workshop today is again going to bring a number of papers uh, again, which hopefully you will enjoy as part of how we can uh, address and exploit virginity at large. Thank you. So uh, going back to uh, where we are, um, So let me just, uh, first of all, introduce, uh, <clears throat> introduce uh, Sergi uh, Abadao from Universita Politecnica de Catalunya. That's again, that's in Barcelona. And Sergi is going to give us a talk on wireless plasticity for massive heterogeneous computer architectures. Sergi, would you please try to see if you could connect and share your screen? Perfect. It's great when technology works. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay. To you, Sergi. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Karim, for the opportunity. Thank you for attendance, for being here today. Yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, wireless technology in the context of heterogeneous computer architectures. This might sound a little bit exotic, but I, I hope I can make the case for it. So as you see by the title, I'm going to talk about the scope of hardware architectures. Um, so mainly what I would explain is a little bit of motivation of why uh, heterogeneous computer architecture are important. I guess you know already know that, but I'll just make a quick reminder. Then talk about how the interconnect is in the center of this and, and how heterogeneity is a challenge for the interconnect. Then I will talk about how wireless can help in, in that regard and how Y plus can go, uh, Y plus, which is the project that I'm coordinating, can go the extra mile 
in this in this context. So, with no further ado, just let me go quickly over the the road to heterogeneous systems. So this is already known by you, but let me just tell that processors are everywhere in our uh, in our cell phones, in our laptops, in data centers, in embedded systems, in appliances, in connected cars. So it's important that. Uh, as people building uh, chips, building processors, it's important that we uh, continue making them faster, making them more efficient so that we can have more, more and more functionalities. But we want them to be faster and more efficient regardless of the workload, right? So if the workload is heterogeneous because the architecture is heterogeneous, we still want this to go faster and more efficient. So ways of doing that, the typical ways are if you do a CPU, you do a general purpose computer, that can work more or less okay for all the workloads or you design accelerators that are very good at, at some things and pretty bad at other things. Or you can take the middle, the middle road. You can create an intelligent system which takes the best of CPUs and general purpose computing and the best of accelerators so that you can have very good performance and efficiency for um, a, a, a pretty broad set of, of workloads or tasks or applications. So a good example of uh, how that trend is going, again, it might be the Pulp platform, which has uh, a, a broad selection of cores, accelerators, different types of interconnects and peripherals, and they somehow they do this kind of pick and place to build uh, different platforms that uh, cater to the needs of different uh, different applications and different workloads. But as I was saying, I'm, I'm here to talk about the, the interconnect, right? So the thing is that gluing all these parts together and putting all these parts together requires something that is able to move the data across these components, right? And in heterogeneous systems, we have the typical challenges of, uh, of processors, which is uh, uh, intense communication requirements, um, especially for, for uh, many core architectures. But on top of that, because we have this heterogeneity, we see that we have a system dependence, like depending on which is the mixture of, of components that we're using, we're going to have one or other communication requirements, but also those requirements are uneven spatially. So uh, one accelerator might have one accelerator might have more requirements than others. Uh, so there's going to be this kind of a, a special, a special uh, uh, uneven distribution. And then temporarily, there's these dynamic requirements in terms of communications because at some point in time the application will require some kind of communication. At some other point in time, will require some others. Right. So. Uh, how do you deal with this? Uh, there are uh, nowadays there are two ways to deal with this. The first one is basically you integrate everything within the same large chip, and the communication is through a fast but uh, let's say rigid network and chip. And this might be the example for this uh, Samsung processor, which is uh, de designed for uh, for the Tesla for the processors which are within the Tesla cars. Uh, you see a GPU, big GPU, neural processing units for for AI. Um, different uh, CPUs and then more specialized, uh, uh, more specialized modules and everything put together with a network and chip. So the thing is that this has high performance because everything is tightly coupled, tightly integrated. The generalization is okay because you can put different types of, of processors and, and put them together. So this thing generalizes well to different workloads, but the cost of building this is very high because making large chips with many different components tightly coupled together uh, you, you know that this is hard to make and the yield is not that great and all these kind of things. So the second way to do that uh, is what AMD is proposing nowadays, which is this chiplet based processors in which the CPU and the accelerators are instead of on a big chip, they are uh, broken down into chiplets and they are wired in a larger interposer system. This interposer serves as a, as a networking package, let's say, uh, which is slower than a networking chip, but and still rigid, but it serves the purpose of, of having, uh, let's say, uh, enough, uh, enough bandwidth for, for this chiplet-based architecture. The cost of this is lower because you disintegrate, because you can have a library of, uh, of hardware IPs that you can put together in the interposer. The generalization is good because you can, depending on what your system needs to look like, you can like build your own system, but the performance is not as good as, as the other option because of this a slower interconnect. So as you can see, the interconnect is at the center and it's defining what, what you can do and what you cannot do, right? So just to a bit more detail on what I mean by rigid. Uh, what I mean by rigid is that 
imagine that I have this system and now I want to incorporate a new memory module on top of, of all these ones, right? So I cannot simply just put it beside, right? So you need more, uh, you, more you need more IO uh, pads, you need to rewire the thing to communicate the memory with the rest of the system. So you cannot just uh, integrate things as easy as pick and place, uh, even though even though interposers are, are disintegrated. Good. So uh, why do I explain all this? Because that's, I'm trying to set the tone for, for, for the vision of our project Weplus. The vision of the project Weplus is to create the next generation of computing systems that are efficient, fast and flexible. So we want to have the efficiency, we, have, we want to have the speed and we want to have it despite having heterogeneous workloads, heterogeneous applications or heterogeneous architectures. So how we envisage that we will realize this is exploiting one key innovation, which is the plasticity offered by wireless interconnects. So if your workload is heterogeneous and is, it changes over time or over space, let's have something that can adapt to this uh, workload instead of having a rigid network and chip that in which the architecture needs to adapt to the network. That's the main idea of, of Wipros. So uh, I don't know if I'm being a bit quick, but let me just go quickly on uh, why wireless. So, and, and, and which are the fundamentals that allow us to say, okay, wireless is possible in these small spaces. Basically, if you know a little bit of, of wireless communications, the size of, a, of an antenna, which is what you need to communicate wirelessly, scales inversely proportional to the frequency of the transmission. So yeah, your Wi-Fi access point has a frequency of five gigahertz. So you have this big antenna that comes out of the router, right? But if you start going up in frequency like 60 gigahertz, which has been proposed for 5G, uh, the antennas already fit within the chip. So we have this concept, concept of on-chip antennas. And let me see if I can put the laser here. Uh, the laser. So this is the typical structure of a chip. Um, you have the, the box silicon and the silicon dioxide uh, in which you have the different metallization layers connecting the transistor. So, basically exploiting this already existing structure to build antennas. And what they say is we take the first layer of metal and we use it as an entry point to the, sing to the wireless signals. And then through a via, we, we connect to what, what a piece of metal, which basically will be our antenna. So with this, you can, you can uh, build antennas which are small enough to fit within the chip. So, and this is from already 12 years ago. So this is not super new technology. It's something that has been done for, for quite a long time. So the idea is if we go beyond 60 gigahertz in, in radio frequency, uh, we can fit more than one antenna within the same chip. And we can fit more than two, more than four, and we can fit even more than 60. And what else? So you, you not only need an antenna, but you also need uh, um, the, the circuits that modulate the information to be fed to the antenna. This is what it's called the transceiver. And on-chip transceivers, they are already a reality. And I'm putting just an example of at 65 CMOS, 65 nanometer CMOS, working at 240 gigahertz, transmitting uh, information at 16 gigabits per second. And all these things take less than two millimeters square of silicon area, consuming less than 220 milliwatts. And this is an early prototype, so this can be improved by a, quite a decent margin. But this is just to explain that this is already a, a possibility, putting antennas and, and, and transceivers within the chip. Actually, this transceiver has already the antenna included in this, in this area. So using these building blocks, we propose to have wireless on-chip communications or one wireless chip-to-chip -chip communications in which we integrate the antennas and the transceivers into chiplets and we com communicate wirelessly through the processor package. This communication is global and is reconfigurable because of the properties of, of wireless communications. And it will always complement a wired network. Don't worry, the wired network will always be there and the wireless can serve to, to, to give an extra boost in terms of bandwidth and flexibility. So the communication happens in this way. You mo the core will modulate the information and will give it to the antenna and the antenna will just radiate. And this radiation will propagate through the package, will be reflected in different components and then will be picked up by the re receiving antennas, which will dec decode the information and will send it to the, to the local core. And since you propagate at all directions, you might propagate at all directions, this might be inherently broadcast. So that's one of the key points of, of these wireless communications. So due to this property and what we'll talk about, about plasticity, we have this extra moderate, moderate cost that we need to assume 
for putting these antennas and so on. But we have excellent generalization because we can uh, adapt to the to the architecture, and we have high performance because on top of the wire network we have an extra boost of bandwidth that uh, can serve to to cater to these needs. So the advantages of wireless is that it has low latency, so you can go from one side of the chip to another side of the chip or the package or the system in a few nanoseconds, as opposed to other interconnects. It's inherently broadcast, as I was saying, and you know, it, it offers plasticity, which we call plasticity, but in the end it's like system level flexibility. You can decide how much bandwidth to send to work, right? And the caveats are that it's less efficient than other, te than other technologies because it's you're radiating instead of guiding the energy, and it, it has a relatively low bandwidth. But by using broadcast and plasticity, we think that the low bandwidth is something that it's affordable. Okay, a detail of plasticity is that we put an extra uh, an extra module. It can be readily served because it, is, it has an antenna. It doesn't need to be rewired with the whole system. And if the uh, if the communication needs of the different chiplets they change for whatever reason, the wireless network can try to adapt to those changing needs. So that's what plasticity is stands for. So um, to further motivate the, the benefits of wireless, let me give you a few examples of how the architecture can benefit from it. It's mainly for shared memory, and there are no chiplets here, there are no heterogeneity here, but maybe this can give you an idea of how this can, can be useful. We first proposed to use wireless for synchronization, for logs and barriers, and this is what we called Ysync. Basically, we had a, a small broadcast memory that uh, was besides the cache coherence protocol. And any write to this small broadcast memory was broadcasted. So everyone had a replicate, replicated copy, current copy of the data that was in the broadcast memory. So it happens that if you use that for logs and barriers, since these are latency critical uh, uh, data, uh, this, let's say, replication that al allows you to read locally from your uh, broadcast memory was speeding up a lot, uh, the different, different applications. We actually uh, rewrote some applications to make use of this broadcast memory uh, through these logs and barriers. And by just enabling one antenna per core at 20 gigabits per second, we had a speed ups of up to 6x and in average, uh, 1.41x. So pretty decent speed up for just 20 gigabits per second of, of wireless. Then we follow up with several works that try to push the limits. Replica is an, an example of pushing the limits with some border to the programmer, but uh, extra speed ups of uh, average of 189. Then we went ahead and just said, okay, what if we can use wireless to change the cache coherence protocol in a way that we can exploit this broadcast? So we had no impact on programmability and still uh, very nice speed ups, again, still at 20 gigabits per second and so on, right? And the technology supported that idea, 10 gigabits per second between one and 10 picojoules per bit and uh, a space of between 0 0.1 and 1 millimeter square for the for the transceiver. So technology was pretty much in line with it. But, and that's what Y plus, uh, that's when Y plus comes into play. What if I told you that instead of 10 gigabits per second, we can go at 100 gigabits per second? And what if I told you that we can go at one picture per bit of energy? And what if we can miniaturize even further the transceivers and go to 0 0.1 millimeter square? And in these figures, that relate the data rate with the power and the transfer area, going into the lower right corner, which is low energy, low area, and very high speeds. What, what if I can do that? And what if I told you that these antennas, instead of just being broadcast, you can reconfigure in a, them in a way that you can have multiple parallel channels that you can also reconfigure. You can have kind of uh, uh, directive beams that go to the receiver that you actually want, and that you can change that over time. That's what Weplus is proposing. How are we going to do that? This is a bit a bit far in terms of of the conceptual things that we need to talk about today. But the thing is that we 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 want to prove that this is possible through graphene antennas in the terahertz band. Maybe this is not your uh, your expertise, but but basically these antennas, what they do is they have this natural operation in the terahertz band. One terahertz is 1,000 gigahertz, so very high frequency, which means more bandwidth. It, these antennas are to 10 to 100 times smaller than metallic antennas. So this means less area, so we can consume less area. And th these are uniquely tunable due to some physical properties that I, I will not discuss, but this allows to implement reconfigurable channels. So this plastic plasticity that we advocate for, this is, this is kind of uh, multiplied somehow by, by <laughs> 10x, let's say, uh, by, by these properties. 
And we, in Whiplash, we try to exploit these, pro with these properties. We want to experimentally prove that this is possible with these antennas, these are possible. We want to prove the co-integration of these antennas with CMOS. We want to demonstrate via simulations that these uh, beams, these steering beams and these different channels are possible. And finally, uh, in the architecture, we want to improve at this one key application, which might be artificial intelligence by at least 10x over, uh, over a non-wireless baseline architecture. An extra comment that Whiplash is not only uh, advocating for wireless, but it's also advocating for heterogeneity. And we have IBM in the consortium, which is pushing in memory computing accelerators. And we, the idea is, OK, we have in memory computing, which has uh, different computing to communication needs, how wireless can take care of that and can uh, can uh, further advance into heterogeneous uh, architectures. And what just one, one quick example of what we're working on in, in Whiplash in terms of architecture, just one transmitter in memory, one receiver in each of the chiplets of a of a DNN accelerator, which is uh, using different chiplets for different for to scale out the accelerator. The plasticity that we were talking about, what it enables here is to to have adaptive data flows, and just by by having a bandwidth of 64 gigabits per second in total, in this extra wireless uh, wireless path, we achieve more than uh, two times the speed up with 38 uh, percent of uh, of uh, of savings in energy. So, uh, sorry if I've been a bit quick, but the conclusions of what I wanted to convey today is that heterogeneous architecture call for versatile solutions that they inter interconnect. So all the things that you discuss in this in this alliance probably have some implications in the in the interconnect. Wireless can respond to those needs with low latency, plasticity, and internet broadcast capability. And we plus we want to go one step further thanks to these graphene antennas. This is a fit open project, so it's a very crazy ideas and see how they can impact uh, different fields. But my question to you today is, which are the challenges that you are facing in hardware and in software regarding heterogeneity and how you think that Weplus can help? So that maybe that's something that can, can trigger discussion. Acknowledgements, you know, and this is the team of the Weplus project, the Fed Open project, as I, uh, as I told you. Uh, if you'd like to know more, we have a website, Twitter, LinkedIn, ResearchGate. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sergi, for this uh, very interesting talk. So uh, yes, certainly a lot of um, uh, interest, especially from the uh, from the heterogeneity alliance in, in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of really the, the the network and wireless uh, connectivity, the actual hardware. So certainly a nice a nice bridge out there. Can I uh, take any uh, questions? We have uh, one from Thomas. Can you see the uh, the question uh, chat, yeah. uh, Sergi? Yes. Yeah. So does the point-to-point -point steering at terahertz prohibit the broadcast use, or can you do both? That's a very good question. So if you do steering, you just target some receivers, so you don't do broadcast. But depending on how broad is your beam, uh, you can multicast. That might be a possibility. So if you want to reach a set of antennas which are in a given area, you can do that. And you cannot do both at the same time, but you have you can have with Keraphine, you can have this array of antennas, which is reconfigurable, so that at one point in time, you might want to do uh, steering, and at one point in time, you might just want to do uh, broadcasting. Note that if you do that, broadcasting is going to be slower than, or slower or less efficient than, than this steering, but uh, you know you can use those trade-offs to, to architect whatever you need. And how many extra fab steps do you foresee to do nanowire antennas and transceivers? So uh, let me answer no graphene and graphene, right? No graphene, which is full CMOS, transceivers and, and antennas. This is already existing technology. I don't think there's a need for extra steps because everything is pretty much into the same PDK kits. Uh, so whenever you have a technology, you have the analog kit and the digital kit. So it's a matter of having a good a good interfacing between the two and a good uh, digital to analog interfacing between the within the architecture but that would not need any extra uh, fab steps with graphene in principle the technology is cmos compatible and amo which is one of the partners of our consortium uh, they are running uh, a, a pilot uh, a pilot uh, line of integration with of cmos and graphene so i guess there's going to be some extra steps of depositing the graphene and doing the interconnect and so on, but uh, nothing uh, have it, nothing that 
takes the chip out of the fab and going somewhere else. So a few extra steps, but I'm not an expert on this, so don't take my word too strongly on it. What would be the processing uh, or chip size overhead be in this step and following terahertz beam, store, beam forming? Can you elaborate a bit more on this? I'm not sure I'm following. Andreas? Make a comment here. Mm -hmm. I'll try to answer what I understand. So in terms of beamforming, so it depends on how you do the beamforming. If you do it the typical way, it's expensive because you need several antennas and you need a transceiver which is able to uh, take each antenna in a way that it's uh, phase shifted a little bit and this is complex to do. But since the other scenario, our scenario is special, you might not need to have the typical requirements of steering that other people do. So you might want to, you might simplify the transceiver. The overhead might be affordable. I do not have numbers, but it might be affordable. And especially with graphene, because of these tunable properties that graphene has, it, it, it gives you some extra degrees of freedom, which simplify the thing. But, but again, I would say that the first step to, to achieve is the realization of full, full architecture and prototypes with broadcasting and full CMOS and then Graphene and terahertz and, and, and beam forming, it's going to be maybe 10 years from now. Okay. Yeah, the process the, to process the beam forming, right? So the overhead is, it shouldn't be that high if we do it like simplify it in a, in a way that it's more analytically integrated and simplified. Okay. Right. Uh, well, let's. Uh, Okay, maybe the last, last, last one by Thomas, and then we have we will have to move to the next uh, talk. Could resist? Is there any uh, wave guiding at the heat spreader level? That's a good question. Actually, uh, we were doing some work on channel modeling, like how much energy is wasted in the path between the transmitter and receiver, right? And silicon is very lossy, right? So whenever that you enter the silicon, the bulk silicon, you start losing a lot of energy. Uh, but we found out that the heat spreader is helping, right? Because it's, it's a good uh, conductor. So that layer is gonna help with the propagation, right? So actually, yes, there's some web gating that uh, if you have the right dimensions and you have the right uh, frequency, you might actually be helping with the heat spreader. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I have a few questions for energy, but I'll take them off. I'm okay. very much interested in the aspect of energy efficiency myself. So thank you, Sergi. Thank, uh, our next, uh, thank you. Our next talk will be on meta orchestrating applications running on heterogeneous infrastructures through low level orchestrators. And we have Francisco, here you are. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. And we can even see your slides. To you, Francisco. And by the way, good to see you. Uh, yeah, good to see you. It's been a while. Uh, yeah, it's been. It's been. <laughs> okay, so, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Francisco Javineto from Atos. Um, I'm coordinator of the Hidalgo, of the Hidalgo project. And I'm going to, to this talk about the meta, how we use meta orchestration in order to, to run some applications in heterogeneous infrastructures. Okay. So first of all, just to present a bit the what is the problem that we see um, when running applications. So you have usually uh, some user that uh, Probably that user will just wants the, to, to use application and is not the developer of the, of the application. And uh, depending on the, on the complexity of the application, you may need to, to really use some uh, external infrastructure. You, you could be using cloud infrastructures, uh, HPC infrastructures, whatever infrastructure that you may need in order to run your application. So um, one, of, one of the first problems is that, first of all, you need to select between different providers. Uh, if you are going to cloud infrastructures, you have Amazon, you have uh, um, the one from Microsoft, you have platforms based on OpenStack, OpenNebula, you have Google Cloud, you have many things to, 
to select each one with their own images and things like this. So first of all, that's problematic because uh, you are not going to have the knowledge of all of them, how they work and, and all these things. Uh, but when you go to HPC, it's even more complicated because first of all, you connect through um, SSH connections. You have just to use command line. You have different workload managers or schedulers also. One of them is Slurm that requires some commands. But if you move to other systems with, for example, OpenPBS, then it uses different commands. And of course, all the time you want to run something, command line. You want to um, see the status of your jobs, command line. So it, this is very complicated for any user, especially when they are not uh, coming from the IT domain. You know, um, So this is the, the, the first problem. Yes, and when we are talking just about infrastructure itself. What happens when you are dealing with the data? OK, you have small files. Usually, you could be able to move them through the typical protocols, yes, HTTP, FTP. You may have some tool that allows you to do some drag and drop, and at some point it will be you will be able to to uh, really put the um, the files where you want it or where you need them in order to do your computations or whatever. But what happens when you have very big files? So in this case, you may try to run normal FTP, HTTP. Uh, probably you are going to to fail with that. Um, we have done um, some, uh, we have tried sometimes to, to run things in which we had to move uh, several gigabytes uh, of data. And in the end, uh, the, the, the normal, uh, the normal uh, data movement was failing. So in the end, you need to go uh, to other tools, which are more complicated. You could use AirClone to move data to clouds. You can use uh, Grid FTP. That is the, the typical one in order to move bi uh, very big um, data sets, especially between HPC uh, infrastructures. But what happens with that? Again, command lines. So in many cases, you still need to use command lines, uh, which are very complex. And if you go to, through the configuration, it can be also a mess. So it's not user-friendly, let's say. So summarizing, first of all, so the point is that uh, in many cases, you, you may have some users of applications that are not IT experts. So maybe they're from uh, a concrete domain, such as chemistry, uh, physics, things like this. So they, have, they may have some knowledge, but they are not as experts as, as the developers or other people who are dealing with this technology every day. Then the point is, um, you have too many technologies, okay? You have too many providers. Nobody can know about everything, you know? So that limits you, the, the things that you can use. And moreover, they are very complex, okay? In the sense that um, um, many times you have to use command lines. Uh, you need to know the commands, uh, how the things work in a low level. And especially the configuration could be really complex. So the point is we need to reduce the complexity. So here is where Metrox trading has a role. So um, how we, th we think it should work? Well, the, the ideal situation could be that the user is selecting the application that, that uh, wants to run, then defines the input parameters that are necessary, just click to run, and it's able to get results and visualize the, these results in the, in the way that, that he or she may need. Okay, so if we translate that to to uh, this idea of the meta orchestration, so basically what the user would do is do this selection, ask this meta orchestrator to okay take the the application, take the data that you may need, move the all these things, do the deployment and the data movement to the infrastructure that I may need. This could be selected manually with the user. Or this could be selected automatically if you, if you have this capability in the mental orchestrator and everything will happen in the background. And then you will just receive some kind of notification. Look, your outcomes are here, ready for you to, to access them. So um, in the end, what is the, the idea behind the, the, the concept of meta orchestration? So, what you are going to have is a kind of high level orchestrator that is going to manage the workflow of the application. That requires also that, I mean, we are thinking about applications in which you can define uh, clear tasks. Uh, usually you have building blocks, so you have clear modules that separate the, the functionality, the different things and the functionalities that you are doing with applications. So you may have some uh, 
data preprocessing tasks, then you, you may do some simulations, calculations, whatever, in several steps, also apply some um, uh, big data analytics uh, uh, tasks, and then in the end to move the data, do some post-processing, so you will be ready for visualiz visualization. And the point here is that um, this uh, high level orchestrator in the end is connecting to other orchestrators because whenever you are connecting to OpenStack in order to run some VMs or you are just sending some jobs to, to a system which is controlled by Slurm, I mean, in the end, they have their own, their own uh, resources management and location uh, uh, solutions, right? So OpenStack will deal with all the physical machines, will create the VMs there where, where you are where it's necessary. Also Slurm does it, its thing. So basically it controls all the nodes you have. It will assign um, the, the nodes to different jobs and so on. So they are doing their thing, you know. So this high level orchestrator basically is asking them to run certain tasks in, in um, using a certain amount of resources, okay? And then they are doing the things that are in their own control. Also, it's important that you have some monitoring in the sense that you will know what's going on there, okay? So that's important. That is part of the interaction uh, that you need to have with uh, these uh, low level orchestrators, let's say. Um, and so the good thing is that in the end, you create this abstraction layer and it's not only the thing that, uh, okay, this one takes care of running here, running there. It has the proper connections for the, for, uh, for the different solutions because this is implemented for you, but also it allows you to do some interesting things such as, for example, uh, enabling hybrid solutions in which you uh, can um, use HPC and cloud resources uh, together in the same workflow. So uh, we have done experiments in which we, we were running, for example, some processing tasks in, in cloud uh, uh, infrastructures because they don't require uh, a lot of resources in order to run. Then we were doing maybe a big simulation in an HPC center because it required a lot of computation. And then once you were finished, we were moving the data to again, some VM in a cloud infrastructure in order to do some post-processing so it will be possible to visualize the results. And that is more efficient in the sense from the HPC side, you are not blocking nodes and you are just using exactly the resources that you need which is also good for you because you will have the opportunity to maybe to enter uh, earlier in the, in the system. And on the other hand, it's also cheaper. Okay. And, and even for them, it's better because at some point, uh, you may be doing some operations that do not require all the nodes that you were reserving. So in the end, this is a win-win a situation, let's say. And now um, I wanted to tell you about a concrete case, which is Groupier, uh, which is an orchestrator that, uh, that we develop. Uh, in Atos. So first of all, just to, to be clear, this is based on a, an existing solution, which is Cloudify. Uh, Cloudify is an orchestrator that uh, uh, is basically uh, focused only on cloud uh, infrastructures. So what we did basically is to create this plugin, which is that is group, it's a plugin for Cloudify, uh, which allows you to uh, use HPC infrastructures. So with this, what we have in the end is a meta orchestrator in the sense that uh, Cloudify and Groupier itself, it's able to connect to uh, cloud infrastructures or even, for example, it's uh, using also you can connect to Kubernetes. Uh, you can connect also to clusters uh, managed by Apache Mesos. And uh, of course, we implemented the um, we implemented the, the connectors in order to be able to send uh, jobs to systems uh, controlled by Slurm, Torque, and PBS Pro. PBS Pro basically is like Torque, but it's a professional version. Now they changed the name uh, to Open PBS. It does not work. So in the end, what you can do is to run these batch applications, uh, both in in a hybrid um, in HPC and cloud in a hybrid way. So as I said before, some tasks can go to HPC, some tasks can go to cloud. And the point is that um, what you have to do is just to define uh, a Tosca file, which uh, basically describes your application. So with the different tasks and, and where they have to, to run. We have defined uh, some small extensions, uh, which are in line with the standard. And uh, it's possible to, to read with the, the definitions uh, to do that. I mean, it's, it's not so complicated. Then uh, we have also embedded other features because um, as I was mentioning before, it's not only the point of um, running the application, I mean, the, the code itself, but also the things that you have to do with the data. 
Um, especially when you want to do uh, do this combination of uh, HPC and cloud, um, then you, you you need to be uh, careful in the sense that you will be moving data from some cloud infrastructure to to the HPC part, do the computation that you need to move the data again, and then you need to do this efficiently. Uh, otherwise, any um, benefit you may obtain of this hybrid solution could be lost because of the time it takes to you to move the data. You know. Um, so one of the things that we, we have been doing is to also integrate the support for uh, data management solutions uh, in the in Krupier itself. So um, with some concrete options in the tasks, uh, it's possible to, uh, to use solutions like Grid FTP. So um, this kind of a special operation will run in the background the, any script which is necessary for you to, to move the data from the target to from the source to the target that you may need. Uh, Grid FTP is, is very, very um, efficient in that sense, especially with, with large data sets. Also, we support the uh, publication of data sets in SICAN. SICAN is a solution for a data catalog. So basically it contains uh, metadata uh, of the data sets, but also it can store uh, some small data sets. But the, I mean, the interesting thing here is that uh, you, need, you use it for, uh, once you generate some result with a simulation or something or, or an application, uh, you generate the data, right, uh, which is the outcome. So what you can do is just ask the workflow just directly to publish uh, the, the information in, um, in a place which is accessible for other people. Also, the things that we have, do, we have done is to uh, and, um, embed uh, some monitoring uh, features in the sense that we can retrieve information about the jobs and statistics um, uh, running the, in the HPC part. This is mainly because you can obtain some information from HPC systems uh, when you are not the one uh, sending the jobs, but you cannot obtain all the day, all the information. Okay, you obtain more information if you are the one who has submitted the job. So this was giving us some uh, interesting information uh, that later on we can use uh, in solutions like uh, because we can link this to accounting uh, components uh, and also. Uh, to service level agreements and things like this. Okay, and uh, one last thing that we we, we have done with um, with Croupier is to work uh, in the um, in the in the interfaces. So, for example, it's possible to use the interfaces it provides in order to build your own uh, graphical user interface. Uh, uh, sometimes we we try to do this, but uh, for um, generating automatically uh, some forms. Uh, according to the inputs you have in your in your workflow, so it it, it's, uh, it generates this automatically, and it's easier for users to to make use of. Yes, some very um, some fast uh, vision of the architecture itself. So in the end, Coupier, as I said, is a, is a plugin, which in the end it's like working inside Cloudify, and uh, what it does is to connect to different. Uh, external uh, systems. So in this case, it will be connecting to Torque and uh, the data movement, movement part will be connecting to uh, two grid FTP endpoints. So uh, the data will be moved in this case from uh, one grid FTP, which is, uh, it's a node, which is in a cloud infrastructure. And that one will be moving the data to, to the one in HPC. This will be the, the way to configure it in order to move data between clouds and, and, and HPC centers. Um, Clar uh, Clarify comes with a, with a nice uh, graphical user interface that can be accessed online. So you can list your blueprints there, you can create instances and all these things uh, very easily. And uh, now the point is, so how this thing can be used? So what is required and how, how you should proceed? Well, so first of all, you need to define uh, what we call the blueprint which in the end, as I said, is a workflow, and this is uh, in Tosca format, which is basically a YAML. And um, then once you have this, and this can, this is not necessarily done by a user, so this would be done by developers of the, of, uh, the application, okay? So if the developer just prepares the blueprint with all these, the things that are necessary and leaves it together with the application, then uh, users do not need to, to take care of that. So they just take that blueprint, and then in the second step, they just need to install the blueprint, okay? 
then uh, what is necessary to do is to uh, provide the inputs. So you are going to create an instance. So the first step is to create the inputs that are necessary for that, uh, that application. And then in a second step, what you do is to launch uh, the instance. So there is one step for preparation of the instance, another one for uh, the execution. And then in the end, you just wait for results. And uh, I just wanted to also to, to show you some example. This is um, um, a, a Tosca file that has uh, have a, as an example in the Hidalgo project uh, for running simulations for COVID-19 with a tool which is called FAX. So um, as you will see here, so first of all, you have a part in which you define the inputs. In this case, uh, they have done that definition in another file, but it will be similar to the definition here of the infrastructure that you have here. So basically, uh, for each input, you just need to put there a couple of lines, so it's not very complex. Then there is a part in which you have the infrastructure definition, so it says uh, basically which kind of infrastructures you can use and the credentials that you're, you are going to use and all these things. So most of these can be uh, just predefined. So you may need only from the user uh, the credentials, something like that. And then when it goes to the uh, tasks themselves, this is not very complicated. So we have just one part in which you define which script you have to use for the deployment and the inputs that need to be used. And another part which tells uh, which is the execution command and, and, and the main conditions. So the configuration of nodes that you, you may want. So this is pretty much what you have to do, okay? So in that sense, once you have this thing um, defined, as, as I said, uh, can be defined by developers, then any user can take it and create as many instances as the user wants in order to make executions, one and one and one another one, okay? And uh, every, every time uh, the user is not taking care of how the infrastructure is, is used, okay? He just, sends the, the, the input, the, the input uh, parameters, click, and then the orchestrator takes care of connecting to the different infrastructures in the background. So as conclusions and future work. So um, as I said, uh, you, you only need to define one workflow and you can run as many times as you want. The complexity of the infrastructure and the data movement and management is abstracted to the users in the sense that they, in the end, they don't need to take care. And uh, this is good in the sense that it's very pretty much extensible, okay? You can support many platforms uh, and um, it allows you to create more and more plugins and, and more extensions. So tomorrow if you want to support uh, another, a new system or a different one that right now is not, is not supported, then it's not so complex to do it. And, but as always, uh, there is still uh, room for improvement. So there is some future work that uh, we have in our minds. So for example, we are thinking about including more intelligence in the sense, for example, of uh, auto selection of different providers and uh, categorization of the different tasks. So just to select automatically, this one is better for HPC, this one is better for, for cloud. Um, just also to support more data management options. For, for example, you could embed some client for Copernicus data, okay? You could embed it there. Um, so for more, platform, pl more platforms, of course, uh, maybe to take more information about monitoring. Right now we are taking basic things. Perhaps it could be extended in the future with uh, information about energy consumption as well and things like this. And uh, another thing that we have in our minds is to um, link this to service level agreements as well. So at some point you could take some decision. If you are going to fail with the service level agreement, uh, then you can reconfigure and to send, for example, uh, the tasks to another different uh, platform. Okay. And that would be all from my side. I think I'm in time. Thank you, Frances. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you very much. We have a qu uh, time for one question. It's by Thomas, who you would like to uh, look on the. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's about cost awareness. Uh, okay. So, in scenario uh, of cloud bursting and scheduling. Uh, we. Yeah, Cloudify uh, has two versions, let's say, the community one and then another one, which is more commercial. We use the, the community version, which has Apache version two license. Cupier is, um, is uh, released as Apache version two as well. So it's totally open source. So you can use it for free, okay. Um, then, 
we'll reduce that to okay but you mean if it's cost aware okay so uh you mean if it's telling if it's taking decisions with respect to uh okay 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 now right now we have not included this kind of intelligence so it's not done automatically okay it is something that we we are working in uh it's something that uh, we have some machine learning models in our minds in which we want to to do this um it's it will be possible for example it's a uh, it's very typical in hpc systems to to define how much time you some world time you know so how much time uh, it should take uh, to run some task and then if, if the task is going to, to run for more time it has to stop so this is uh, some of these are some of the things that we have in our mind in order to uh, to do this categorization and allocation of uh, of providers Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Uh, our next speaker is Indiga. So uh, Francisco has to first to uh, stop sharing so that Indiga can actually start sharing. There you are. And by the way, I really like the name of the uh, of the project. Uh, sorry. <laughs> to you. Uh, I... You can move into presentation mode. <laughs> and we can start. Oh, there's some problem. Sorry. It is All right. Karin, okay. Karin, Take your sorry. time. It is a good name because oh, there is a good brand strategy behind in terms of That's the right, communications yes. manager of the project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Communication is key. Yes. You mean soda, right. soda light name? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so, soda light name. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm Indika. I'm from uh, Tilburg University and uh, Jerry Mas Academy of Data Science. is from Netherlands. And uh, so, so in the uh, I'm going to present uh, one uh, part or aspect of soda light. Uh, then uh, I have another. Uh, Two of my colleagues actually present the other part of the solar light. Uh, my focus on the runtime, uh, where the deployment, monitoring, and uh, runtime adaptation of the uh, application. Uh, yeah, this is the outline. So I will uh, provide an overview, then uh, focus on the key uh, uh, three part deployment, monitoring, and, and adaptation. Uh, in brief, uh, SodaLight project uh, try to uh, provide some uh, capability to uh, simplify uh, development, deployment, and management of uh, application on heterogeneous infrastructures. Uh, infrastructures uh, include uh, HPC Cloud and Edge. And uh, to do that, we have two main uh, part of the project, like one focus on the development uh, or design time. Uh, it's a development environment. Uh, targeting for the uh, uh, development uh, of the application. And then the runtime environment where we, uh, we deploy the application, monitor and uh, then adapt the application. So my focus on the runtime. And uh, so uh, first, uh, the output from the development environment is a, a optimized uh, blueprint. Uh, blueprint uh, is the uh, model that describe the deployment model. Uh, then the orchestrator can deploy this uh, on heterogeneous infrastructures, uh, running application on HPC Cloud and Edge. Then, uh, so the orchestrator uh, deploy the application, and then there's a monitoring system uh, which can monitor, uh, collect the data from uh, heterogeneous uh, resources and also application and use the, then there's a third part refactoring that use this uh, monitoring data and uh, to uh, make uh, some optimization uh, like for example uh, horizontal and vertical scalability or uh, finding some better uh, deployment alternatives better uh, deployment better resources uh, and uh, also uh, uh, the finding some issues in the deployment, for example, performance anomalies and so on. So that is a, a part of the adaptation. So we find these issue and try to fix them at runtime. Uh, we are redeployment. Uh, now, yeah, I will first focus on the orchestration. Uh, in the orchestration, uh, 
we use uh, meta orchestration. Uh, we have our own uh, orchestrator uh, called Xopera. It's again open source uh, from Xlab. Uh, this is the simplified uh, architecture of the orchestrator. Uh, as I said, it's a meta orchestrator and uh, meta orchestration is done by using infrastructure as a code. Uh, in our implementation, we use Tansible. Uh, here, uh, deployment model, uh, that is a deployment topology, as well as resources are described uh, using uh, Tosca open standard as well as Ansible. And um, the orchestrator based on this uh, Tosca and Ansible based uh, deployment model, uh, orchestrator can uh, provision resources uh, across multiple uh, heterogeneous uh, resource providers using the, uh, the orchestrators resource orchestrated provided by those infrastructures. Uh, then to validate uh, this deployment model also we have support for uh, validating Tosca and Ansible file. Uh, then uh, we need to support multiple version of uh, deployment models. Uh, to do that uh, we keep the uh, um, uh, version and state of uh, deployment model. And then also we are in the orchestrator, uh, when we go into uh, provision res uh, and uh, provision resources and deploy application across uh, heterogeneous uh, multiple uh, res orchestrators, we need to uh, uh, perform a lot of uh, security authentication and authorization uh, and also uh, we need to uh, move data between different uh, orchestrator. Uh, for that, again, we use uh, infrastructure as a code. Uh, for example, Ansible uh, module for uh, for the data management, we use the infrastructure as a code. For example, Ansible modules for uh, uh, copying and moving data. Uh, also, uh, we are using, uh, we are at the moment trying to use uh, the data pipeline uh, provided by Apache Nifi. So with that, uh, we can uh, provide some general approach to move the data between uh, different cloud uh, and other infrastructure providers. And for the authentication, we use the key clock based uh, authentication and authorization solution. Uh, in general, uh, we use meta orchestration. So for the moment, uh, we support uh, several uh, different type of uh, infrastructures, Amazon, uh, Amazon OpenStack, uh, Kubernetes for, for both Edge and Cloud, and Tor, uh, and also some other um, uh, infrastructures. And in future, we also plan to support uh, Google Cloud and so on. So in general, we try to cover both uh, the public cloud, uh, private cloud, HPC and Edge. So uh, then the, those are the capability of the orchestration. And so once we have deployed the application, we need to be able to monitor the application as well as the uh, resources used by the application. Uh, for that, uh, we uh, have a monitoring system which is based on the uh, Prometheus, uh, one of the open source uh, monitoring, uh, popular open source monitoring system. Uh, here uh, uh, is the high level uh, design of this uh, monitoring system. Uh, uh, there are set of uh, exporters which are responsible for collecting uh, data uh, from different resources. And these exporters are deployed, uh, deployed in each node in the infrastructure. Uh, then uh, the, we are exporters, uh, the Prometheus uh, can collect the, the monitoring data. Uh, then in addition, we have an alert manager that based on this uh, raw monitoring data, uh, alert manager can uh, generate high level alert. Uh, some of these alert can be related to uh, SLA violation. And uh, uh, because uh, in our infrastructure, we uh, need to de we need to deploy multiple application. So per each application, uh, we have used different type of alerts uh, because alerts are, are depend on the application. Uh, so the, in order to be able to define different type of alerts and alert uh, tools, alert alert rules for each uh, application, so we provide the management interface. 
that can be used by SodaLite ID via SodaLite ID that this is a deployment environment uh, that the developer can uh, define the alert rules. And also uh, this alert can be used by the refactoring. Uh, refactoring can subscribe to this alert and based on the alert, uh, refactoring uh, can trigger refactoring decision, like for example, uh, redeploying the application. Uh, for the H part, uh, we also uh, have Prometheus based monitoring, uh, both a single cluster as, a, as well as multi cluster uh, edge environment. Uh, but the architecture is same, uh, like we use the Prometheus uh, set of exporters to collect the data, then the alert manager to uh, process the raw data and generate the alert, and uh, the Prometheus service to keep the uh, data and uh, the connection between alert manager and exporters. So once we have the monitoring data, then uh, we need to be able to use this monitoring data to uh, perform some uh, intelligent tasks. Uh, here uh, come the deployment refactoring. So uh, the, the key motivation for deployment refactoring is uh, because uh, in uh, heterogeneous environment, uh, we have a lot of uh, different type of resources and different resources mean uh, different performance uh, properties for the application. Uh, and also many uh, number of resources mean also there are many number of uh, deployment possibilities for the application. So uh, uh, in general, application can be deployed uh, in uh, different ways. So it create uh, many deployment variant or deployment, deployment alternatives. And uh, we need to be able to use the correct uh, or correct deployment alternative for a given context. Uh, so we need to be able to switch between different deployment variant as the context change, for example, workload change. And also uh, the, 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 some deployment uh, can be, uh, become problematic over time. Uh, for example, sometimes some, uh, the, the, some of the node uh, fail. Uh, also, uh, sometime uh, due to the changes in the context, uh, some uh, some of the deployment security policies uh, be become violated. Uh, also, is it it is possible a different type of uh, anomalies, performance anomalies, memory anomalies, network anomalies uh, can occur. So we need to be able to identify these thing and uh, make uh, fixes, or we need to identify the these issues and try to uh, uh, perform some corrective actions. And uh, third motivation is that uh, this, uh, when, uh, this infrastructure is dynamic. So there are always uh, some changes, especially cloud and edge, uh, where new compute node become available, sometime uh, existing uh, currently used devices become unavailable. Uh, then, then the, the, the some node change their resource configuration and so on. So we need to be able to identify these uh, like changes or detect these changes. And based on these changes, we need to be able to make uh, corrective actions uh, so that we can uh, optim optimize the resource usage and uh, prevent SL SLA violation and any other kind of failures. Uh, so, for that, we have uh, something called uh, predictive deployment refactoring. Uh, uh, this uh, deployment refactorer uh, the, uh, can monitor the uh, infrastructure and application uh, based on the monitoring information. Uh, deployment refactorer uh, can uh, evaluate and identify uh, alternative deployment. In order to identify alternative deployment, uh, sometimes we need to have the knowledge about uh, uh, currently available resources and uh, possible alternatives for each resources and so on. Uh, to do that, uh, there's a component called uh, deployment option uh, discoverer. Uh, the uh, main responsibility of this component is to find alternative resources and alternative uh, resource and uh, deployment model fragment. And deployment refactorer uh, use a machine learning based model to 
uh, evaluate different deployment alternatives, uh, basically to predict the uh, performance and other metrics of different deployment alternatives and select the best one for a given context. And uh, once it uh, found the deployment alternative uh, using the orchestrator, uh, it can uh, redeploy the application to use the new deployment alternatives. Uh, orchestrator uh, can uh, calculate the difference between current deployment and the, ex uh, the new uh, deployment. And based on the those differences, orchestrator can uh, do the undeployment, undeployment, and uh, make sure that uh, application is uh, redeploy uh, smoothly. Uh, in, addition, in addition to this uh, alternative deployment, uh, Refactoring, uh, there's a, another component called node manager. Uh, responsibility of node manager is to support uh, horizontal and vertical scalability. Uh, so node manager can uh, uh, monitor uh, some uh, performance goal, some performance target, for example, rest uh, response time target. And to maintain that, uh, it can uh, allocate resources, CPU or GPU resources. So all uh, the, the node manager and deployment refactor and the uh, deployment option discoverer, uh, uh, along with the uh, orchestrator, monitoring system and uh, knowledge base, uh, support uh, predictive deployment refactoring. Uh, so uh, this provides some example. Uh, this this uh, refactoring uh, we da do for one of our use case, uh, it's called vehicle IoT use case. Uh, there are several reconfiguration scenario. Uh, there are some example, for example, uh, sometime uh, we have to redeploy and the application uh, in order to maintain uh, GDPR compliance requirement, uh, sometime to avoid uh, failure of some devices and so on. Uh, all these scenarios are supported by our uh, refactoring support. Uh, these are uh, some of the result. Uh, this is about the machine learning models uh, that uh, machine learning uh, models we use for uh, predicting the performance and other metrics of uh, alternative deployment. Uh, the challenge is that when you have a lot of alternative deployment, we cannot me uh, measure the performance of each, uh, we need to be able to uh, measure for minimal subset or sample of the uh, deployment alternatives and predict the, uh, based on those data, predict the response time for uh, other, uh, predict the performance for other variant. So the, we have developed a machine learning based approach. This. A diagram show the effectiveness of those approach, uh, those machine learning model and the approach. Uh, the sample size, uh, even for the uh, small sample, uh, we can predict uh, accurately the performance of the all uh, uh, available variants. Then uh, this is the sum result for the node manager. Uh, as mentioned earlier, node manager support, uh, at the moment support vertical scale build. It support uh, allocation of GPU and CPU resources, uh, as well as uh, scheduling uh, requests. And here the comparison between uh, node manager and the uh, rule-based uh, aesthetic allocation. And the node manager uh, actually use control theory uh, to perform this allocation and take the schedule addition. So uh, as sh from the, this result, uh, node manager can uh, prevent uh, SLA violation, uh, also uh, can uh, reduce the resource usage. Uh, in conclusion or in summary, uh, SodaLite provide, SodaLite runtime environment is to enable deployment and management of application on uh, heterogeneous infrastructures. Uh, for, uh, at the moment, uh, so we are working on uh, like supporting more uh, or different type of infrastructures uh, and also, uh, also support more uh, deployment refactoring scenarios.
yeah, that's all. Sorry. If, um, okay. oh, no worries. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. Uh, we may have uh, time for one minute. Well, we have time for one minute. Uh, there are no questions on the on the chat. So I will you. Uh, so my my question is very much about the, the refactoring aspects and, and of course the need for adaptation, right? So it, it, it seems that to me that traditionally, when it comes to adaptation, you will have some form of map framework where you monitor, you analyze, you plan, and finally you execute, right? Yeah. And my question is very much about by doing that, you will, you will hopefully you will be able to learn, therefore to extract knowledge. Yeah. Uh, like, yes. yeah, that's true. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. So can, can you elaborate on your approach as compared to the traditional one? Uh, so uh, traditional in the sense like uh, we use the same control loop, like the yeah. self adaptive system. Uh, but here the, 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 our focus is different because we more focus on uh, like infrastructure level adaptation and also uh, try to combine the infrastructure level adaptation with the application adaptation mm -hmm. and but in general that control flow we use the same control flow it's the control flow yeah. yeah okay okay thank you for this again the reason is, is that if, if if you take it in a context where an application is running on on any distributed infrastructure could be again a, say an iot layer an edge layer a cloud layer there are so many events that you can monitor here and there in order, of course, to, uh, to use the data to be able, again, to, 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 react, to react to change. Yeah, that's true. We actually thank you very have, much. Okay. Thank you for this. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. So our uh, last uh, talk for the first part of this session uh, will be uh, given by um, uh, Martin on hardware and software co-design aspects in social science. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, we can hear you. Perfect. And uh, we are waiting for your slides. Waiting for, your presentation. for slides, okay, you let up. me, you let me share my screen, okay. Uh, okay, I need to organize, I think. Okay, I suppose this will be. Can you see it now? In Brilliant. A, in in a full, yeah, there. in a full screen. Okay. Full screen. Thank yeah, you. that's that's perfect. Okay, the um, this is another presentation from the Hidalgo project. Yeah, the previous one was given by the by the Javier, and um, I, I'm representing the 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 same project. Um, but this time I would like to focus on this hardware and software co-design yeah, related to, to the applications which are part of our um, use cases. Uh, they are from the domain of the social science yeah, simulations. So, but, uh, but let me uh, in the first place introduce a little bit, yeah, this, uh, uh, maybe I'm not sure it's switch. Yeah, this should be slide number two. Can you see it? I suppose, yes. Anyway. Uh, uh, the project is coordinated by the ATOS. The technical coordination is uh, is uh, on the HLRS hands. We we have 13 partners from the seven different countries. We started off this project in December 20 to, to 2018, and uh, uh, yeah, basically on the on the on the screen you see the. Um, uh, the website address and information, more information about the about the partners. Uh, but what is the uh, what is the um, high level ambition yeah, of the project? Can you see slide number three? Because I'm not not sure if I'm switching correctly. Yes. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, that's perfect. So in, in the first place, we'll get to benefit from the synergy because we are concentrating on the on the different areas, yeah, like uh, uh, utilization of the global uh, challenges uh, related applications uh, with uh, utilization of uh, HPC, HPDA and uh, AI methods. Um, we would like to, of course, 
train and uh, connect the different communities and provide a, a single point of entry yeah, for decision makers, technic technical experts, and other relevant entities. Um, yeah, for this for this area we are interested in, which are uh, the global challenges. The next uh, uh, the next uh, target yeah, I would like to focus is uh, yeah, using this baseline, baseline of HPC, HPD, and AI, we'd like to advance some state-of-the-art of mechanism for the data analytics and um, develop uh, some, some dedicated AI methods yeah, for, the, for the simulation workflow and uh, focus to, 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 to some aspect related with building up some, some coupled simulations yeah, to get some, some synergy effect from from it and of course advance uh, multi-domain portal for the uh, for this community okay but uh, the work um, in the in the project is uh, oriented around three main use cases the first one is uh, is for the refugee simulation so in this um, in this use case we are going to to develop the, some realistic models for the simulating refugee streams so to 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 help uh, complete um, some incomplete information on the refugee movements which could help some some decision makers and um, investigate what are the consequences of this uh, national closing yeah and its borders the the second use case uh, is um, around the social media yeah especially twitter twitter message uh, simulation so we're trying to to analyze the structure of the social network simulate the spreading uh, messages uh, through the through, through, through this through this network and under uh, understand the, the phenomena yeah, of the fake news yeah what, what what causes how how they behave yeah in the in this in this in this networks but the third one is uh, is oriented on the on the urban air pollution. As you know, it is most prominent, most uh, import, one of the most important problem yeah, in the in the common uh, in the in the contemporary world. Um, so we like to simulate the pollution in the cities and the couple um, agent-based street networks with the traditional CFD models, and uh, which are also connected with the with the weather information. And uh, provide uh, yeah some 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 valuable information to the stakeholders and politics uh, uh, to 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 make a, a yeah appropriate decision on that. But of course this uh, this presentation is is on the co-design aspect, and uh, from our perspective we we may distinguish two um, two approaches: the software and software co-design and hardware software co-design. In the first uh, in the first aspect. Uh, we we would like to concentrate on this adaption of the of the codes uh, based libraries capabilities different yeah mpis for example uh, libraries for the communication adopt uh, new features of the software libraries in the second one we would like to study this behavior of the hpc hpda tools on the machines and architectures and the port codes yeah uh, and um, in this way that um, utilization of the devices of the architectures would be yeah on the highest level let's say uh, in the hidalgo um, yeah going go if if uh, if it boils down to the some specific tools yeah in the hidalgo we may distinguish and uh, the, the the following uh, yeah most prominent let's say applications but um, related with the simulations with the data analytics uh, some coupling tools like a croupier fabsim and the visualization tools uh, co-voicing visualizer but in today's presentation i'm going to to concentrate ex solely on this on this on the simulation tools yeah like free open form eigenvalue uh, and uh, social network simulator and uh, in order to give you an idea what what this what this what uh, what this flea application uh, does, um, yeah, this slide was prepared. But basically, it simulates the movement of the individuals across uh, graphical locations, and uh, it is implemented in the agent-based modeling. And each refugee is represented as a single agent. We have uh, four different uh, types of location, conflict zones, camps, uh, regular locations, and uh, redirection points. And um, of course, the code uh, was paralyzed. Yeah, uh, in the in the Hidalgo. Yeah, we started with the single node uh, implementation. The moment it is paralyzed, it is developed by the by the by our partner Brunel University of London. Implemented in Python, the code is uh, yeah, it is open source, available on the GitHub. 
In the case of the urban air pollution, yeah, um, for the simulation, we use uh, open form application, which is the open source CFD software. As you know, probably it is well known application, but the uh, UAP pilot uses it to provide more accurate, most uh, fast CFD simulation of the uh, multi component airflow in the cities and in incorporates. Uh, in order to 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 better yeah simulate the 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 the, the thing um, yeah this 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 phenomena we we incorporated many let's say outside uh, outside data which are which which have uh, a crucial influence yeah on the on the on the on the output yeah provided by the um, by the open form uh, and in order to do that, we we uh, we are collaborating with the ECMWF, for example, where we are yeah, acquiring some weather data. Where uh, another partner provides some information about the traffic. Uh, all these things are yeah incorporated in the model uh, developed by the by the share. And of course, the open form is in the C plus um, plus. The another application is basically two two applications yeah because uh, in in the case of the social network we 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 have two of them the eigen value is used to is used for the validation yeah? because in the first step we need to we need to generate synthetic network and in order to compare it with the uh, real one yeah we need to we need to have um, a, a dedicated application for that this is the, the this eigen value uh, the comparison. The second one, as a simulator, is used for the simulation of the spreading messages. Yeah, this is exactly the, the simulator um, we are using for 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 the computing and seeing how this uh, how how yeah yeah this be phenomenon behaves. Yeah, this uh, applications both applications are developed by the Plus and in the Python, uh, but. Um, of course, this presentation is about the co-design aspect, but in order to 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 give you an idea about the scalability, yeah, I I, I decided to put this uh, uh, slide as well. So as you see, um, how the fix evolves, yeah, uh, through the time in the Hidalgo. So uh, for the for uh, and uh, how much efforts, yeah, how uh, at the moment we are able to to utilize because one of the uh, one of the goal. Uh, in the in the project is uh, uh, to yeah to pave the way to the exascaling. So so of course uh, according to our KPIs we need to at the end of the project we need we need to be able to uh, utilize um, one uh, one hundred thousand cores. And um, at the moment for the migration for the fee we are able to 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 use. Uh, 16,000 cores for the for the ur urban air pollution. Yeah, the situation wasn't clear. Yeah, we started with the Phoenix HPC version, and um, we ended up at the moment with the open form, uh, and we were able to scale it up to the to the 4,000 cores. And the, for the social networks, yeah, here we have the most prominent, uh, let's say valuable uh, figures which are um, uh, 32,000 cores for the for the POCAC graph. Uh, okay, of course there is uh, there is some uh, benchmarking methodology which is behind this all, all measurements, but um, I don't want to bother you about this uh, about this formulas, but what is the most important that we are uh, yeah executing all this uh, 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 on this test until we get 95% uh, uh, of confidence and uh, the error is smaller than 5%. Yeah, uh, the part of the methodology we, we are also, uh, yeah, implemented in, in this co-design um, investigation is, is also definition of the three scenarios. The first one is the core-wise system comparison. Um, basically, it is it is about the, finding the common ground, yeah, for the uh, for all machines which are which are part of this of this test, uh, and um, and that's why um, we 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 decided to pick up this uh, three values which are yeah the common for for all. Free um, machines. The, so, so this is the 14 cores uh, because this, this is the smallest common value for all uh, processors which are part of this um, test. Uh, 28, which is the smallest common value per node, and the full node whenever it applies. Uh, Note-wise system comparison. It is uh, it is it is the situation when we. Uh, 
whole node yeah was assigned to 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 to, to execute some uh, some some job uh, and in this case, we have for the eagle provider, uh, which is which is hosted uh, by the at, at the PSNC. Uh, we have 28 cores per node. For the hawk, we have 128 cores per node, and the Vulcan 40 cores per per node. In the scenario three, yeah, it is a little slightly bit different because um, we assume that there is some fixed amount of time in which we need to um, execute some. Uh, some task and the question is what the what the resources are required yeah to 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 fulfill this uh, limitations and if we look at the at the at the at the servers and, uh, and the processors which are used to um, for this for these benchmarks and uh, uh, basically, the, the, these are free. The Eagle, as I as I mentioned, uh, which is hosted at the PSNC, Hawk and Vulcan at the HLRS. You got all of all figures here. So as you see, the um, the Eagle is the weakest in the in the in this in this comparison. And uh, basically, IMD ROM seems to be the most uh, uh, the most. Uh, um, yeah, the the the, the hardest uh, yeah, uh, s s server in this uh, in this uh, in the stake. Uh, uh, so we have two two processors, uh, two, 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 let's say two vendors, Intel and AMD ROM. And um, of course, this is only about the initial results of the of the co-design because we started this process recently. And uh, yeah, I give you now some uh, some some uh, some some ideas. First, let's start with the migration. Yeah, which is which is this flea application developed by the by the bull. These are the number of parameters. So it means that we are dealing in the situation when we started with uh, 2 million agents and uh, new uh, 10k agents are added every each step. This is the size of the graph and um, parallel, parallel mode is advanced and iterations to 100. Anyway, in the scenario one where we are dealing with this core-wise uh, system comparison, uh, so as you see, and basically, this is not a, a let's say a big surprise here that uh, the most uh, um, the, mm, the 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 slowest machine is is an eagle. Yeah, in this oh, sorry, uh, in this uh, in this comparison, uh, the hawk is. Uh, the Hawk is yeah slightly better. The Vulcan yeah is the best for this comparison when we run this uh, this test on the 14 on 28 cores yeah. Mm. Uh, but uh, in the case of the full node yeah of course Hawk yeah vastly outperforms because of this number of uh, of um, of CPU cores per node. Anyway. Mm, this is the information from the first test in a case in in a situation when we are doing with this uh, node wise yeah, system uh, uh, comparison we 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 may see that uh, 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 both systems like a, like a hawk and vulcan are uh, yeah, provide some serious improvement or uh, improvement over the older eagle uh, this uh, this chart presents the um, yeah, this uh, how how much yeah we may benefit to use this two uh, this two system because uh, the baseline here is the eagle. So how much we are it uh, yeah outperforms yeah comparing to these two systems uh, comparing to the eagle, and uh, eagle nodes are more efficient for the for the flea execution yeah which is uh, which is which is also not natural. Uh, execution on the in, in the in the third scenario where we are dealing with this limited amount of time uh, on this slide we present how much yeah resources are required to to execute some some certain amount of uh, um, yeah to 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 execute certain amount of jobs uh, so as you see uh, for the for the eagle um, yeah we require the most nodes like seven. And uh, for the for the Vulcan uh, free nodes, and the same job can be executed only with the one node uh, with on on the on the Hawk. 
Um, and of course, uh, the conclusion could be could be only the one that uh, Hawk is the best choice for this for this free execution, which is which is an, a natural. Like, okay, for the urban air pollution and uh, open form in the scenario one when uh, we are looking on this uh, core wise aspect and we compare this uh, 14 and 28 cores uh, as you see um, yeah this uh, um, uh, it basically it is it is comparable yeah on the um, on the on the on the, the runtime is comparable on Eagle and the and the Hawk. However, the the worst efficiency yeah is the is the for for for, for the for the Hawk because of this yeah, huge amount of the of the of the cores. But yeah, we we didn't get so so much yeah, expected uh, benefits yeah from 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 it yeah comparing to the to the efficiency. And the uh, best performance, of course, is an, an, on a full note on Hawk, yeah, which is which is uh, yeah, expected, let's say. In the in the note-wise system comparison, the Hawk provides a serious improvement, yeah, over older Eager. So as you as you see, uh, this, basically this is the the comparison between the in, in a different in a different. Uh, in a different uh, cases, yeah. Where again, the baseline here is the eagle, but uh, we we did this comparison not only for the for the UAP uh, pilot for the open form, but also for uh, for the lean pack and the memory bandwidth uh, uh, benchmark. This is this is the the, the red red line, and um, as you see. And the UAP can um, yeah, take advantage of this improvement, uh, yeah, comparable performance to 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 to, to mm. uh, In the in the third case, where execution of the Eagle takes more nodes and um, core hours to complete the task within the same time limit. And uh, yeah, the efficiency on the Eagle is the worst compared to yeah, more than 50% on one node, but still, yeah, it is much better than than that on a Hawk. In uh, in the case of the uh, third use uh, pilot, which is the social network and these two application eigenvalue and uh, and the messages propagation, and uh, for the for the scenario one, we. We received the, the, the following uh, figures, which are presented on this chart. For the eigenvalue estimation, Vulcan yeah, offers the best single single node performance. And uh, when using the full node, yeah, this in, in this case uh, uh, the Vulcan yeah is similar in the performance to the Hawk yeah, despite uh, yeah lower core number. Uh, which is which is su surprising a little bit, yeah. And the eagle is um, yeah approximately only yeah forty percent behind, even though this uh, the, the, this this uh, this number of course is much much smaller. Um, in a case when we are dealing with the time limit, so as you see, the Vulcan utilizes the uh, least core hours because of the lower number of performance cores. In uh, in, uh, in another application uh, in this uh, in this uh, social network simulator in this first scenario, um, yeah, the performance in comp is comparable whenever we're executing on the same number of cores, which is uh, which is also yeah a little bit surprising here. Uh, but uh, having more cores, yeah, for example, we go for the Vulcan on on Hawk, yeah, we provide yeah we can get a more more speed up. But um, yeah, whenever we deal with this node-wise uh, system comparison, yeah, because of this, um, yeah, plenty of cores provided by the Hawk, we can we can see a significant speed up, yeah, over the Intel architectures, and on Hawk it is it is pointless to our more cores nodes, um, yeah, to go uh, below uh, train uh, um, a certain threshold. Okay, uh, the last one is. Uh, is uh, is for the for the uh, situation when we are dealing with this uh, certain amount of time, and we we got this limitation. So as you see from this chart, um, execution uh, 
um, yeah, the same work on the ego requires most uh, nodes, but um, yeah, and consume most uh, core hours. But the differences are not so significant as in the previous cases, yeah, because there the differences were yeah notable at the moment. It is they they are not. So 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 the newer the conclusion could be the newer uh, Intel CPU architecture on the Vulkan. Um, which is Cascade Lake uh, versus Haswell on the Eagle, yeah, offers a small uh, offers a smaller lithography, and of course supports uh, faster yeah memory and uh, more cores, and um, despite the slower uh, base clock frequency, it performs uh, better yeah than old uh, generation of processors like uh, Haswell, and. Um, yeah, and um, the, the final conclusions, yeah, mm, uh, could be, yeah, to be honest, after delivering all these tests, we, we have we have more questions than answers, especially in this con design yeah, areas. And especially in, in, in respect of the efficiency, as you saw, as you saw, this is, uh, there is no clear answer, yeah, which architecture to pick up. Of course, whenever you can, you, you don't care about the, let's say, resources, about the money, please go for the far, fastest, yeah, architecture. So, so you, you, you may, yeah, significantly benefit for, for, from it. But uh, yeah, in most cases, in many cases, we we yeah, this this aspect of the of the money of the resources should be considered. And uh, yeah, of course, Eagle is in the in this in the weakest in the comparison. But if you can't afford to to go for um, all out, let's say, so sometimes it is a, a good solution. Yeah, in the case of the application, and uh, to be honest, yeah, there is no clear direction at the moment. That's why we decided to go deeper into application, uh, to 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 make some profiling on it, uh, make some optimization test technique, and see how uh, it uh, it affects yeah the final result. Uh, and of course, in some applications like uh, OpenFORM, we would like to also utilize some, some accelerators, uh, this GPGPU cards. And uh, of course, we would like to also go beyond yeah, this HPC and also concentrate on the data analytics on this um, HPDA methods. And yeah, that's all from my side. Excellent. Thank you, Marcin. Uh, I do not see any questions in the chat. However, maybe a very, very quick one. It, it looks like you, the number of cores was always been limited to, um, to, to Hulk, which uh, was 128 as, as far as I Yeah, know. yeah, 128, yes. exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you, do, 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 I mean, again, it, 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 it's interesting that at the end of the day, you had, you had some lessons learned right especially with regards to the aspects of co-design so is, is is there is there one what one lesson that you feel was the best lesson you've learned one lesson yeah the, the, yes, there are the, 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 yeah there are no clear are clear answers as i <laughs> as, as, as i said yeah of, of course uh, as i said in my fi final conclusions yeah, whenever you you you, you may afford uh, um, to 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 apply for the for the for the big bold infrastructures please please go for it but whenever yes. you, you 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 consider yeah some cost yeah the amount of course which are which are used uh, and and some so some amount of money yeah so please the answer are not so clear so so at the, at the moment, we also don't have a clear conclusions. Yeah, maybe we would like to investigate and co cooperate, of course, with the heterogeneity alliance. Yeah, in this, in this re re respect. Yeah, to 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 get more more information and maybe yeah, based on that uh, and uh, yeah, having all these profiling issues. Yeah, and my, uh, this aspect on these accelerators. Uh, yeah, we, we we maybe yeah drew some yeah path uh, yeah. that should that, that 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 should be some some yeah yeah a bridge to, to yeah a bridge to collaboration yeah yeah excellent yeah, thank you very much to everyone uh, to all our four speakers we have time for about eight minutes uh, break uh, because we obviously we are running a little bit out of time uh, out of time so time to refill your uh, cup of coffees and uh, let's uh, come back in about eight minutes. Thank you everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's uh, resume our series of uh, talks. And the fifth talk will be given by uh, Jesus, who I have the pleasure to welcome. Hello. Hello, Good Jesus. Afternoon. Can you hear me well? We can hear you. And if you could share your screen. Brilliant. So excellent. You can see the presentation, right? Yes. To you, okay. Jesus. So thank you so much for this invitation to participate and present our results in this workshop. My name is Jesus Goitia in representing Atos in the context of Sodalite project. That will be the second presentation of a series of three Sodalite presentations today. The, one, the first one was presented by Indica describing the runtime environment. And here I'm going to discuss and, and, and present the modeling approach that we are adopted to uh, model application for heterogeneous environments. So I will start by um, I will start by uh, introducing a little bit the, the context of the project with the perspective of modeling, uh, and also I will I will describe what is the modeling approach that we have designed and implemented. And then I will go through the different domain specific languages or meta models that we have designed for the purpose of modeling complex applications, the editors that we have as well implemented for such uh, modeling support, and all together constitute what we call the smart ID for which uh, some um, smart features will be introduced as well. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will simply I will um, summarize the innovative aspect of the approach, and I will compare with the related work. So uh, I will start by by describing we, what we understand by the complex application. Uh, by complex application, we understand complication that may offer some uh, non-functional uh, aspects like redundancy fault tolerance, uh, to offer high availability, or the possibility to observe or monitor the, the application performance. Applications that typically are uh, deployed as services, microservices, or even uh, jobs that could be executed in batch with, with uh, different uh, infrastructure, including Cloud, Edge, and HPC. An example of this complex application could be Netflix. So with this idea of complex application in mind, the sort of like project provides tool with the purpose to simplify and to speed up the development of uh, infrastructure as a code for complex applications with the focus on deployment and deploying and executing then in this mixture of hybrid infrastructures. The main focus of the project is on simplifying and um, supporting by use of uh, some soft intelligence I will describe uh, this infrastructure as a code modeling, particularly the uh, modeling the performance of applications and improving the quality of the modeling infrastructures as well. And also to support the dynamic management of infrastructure to boost performance. This was the aspect that was already introduced by Indicas in his presentation. So despite we are addressing uh, users, uh, non-expert users, we are assuming that they have some sort of IT competence. So I will start by, by, by describing a high level uh, sort of like method for design time and run, uh, deployment time. The runtime uh, approach was already introduced by Indica. Here we are starting from an infrastructure which has to be uh, modeled by resource experts who are in charge or infrastructure manager who are in charge of um, describing the resources that are available in infrastructure. On the other hand, we have as well uh, the application expert or application manager which, uh, who is describing the complex application in terms of component and how they are uh, deployed. I mean, they are describing the topology of this application. And all these models are pro um, produced in the ID. So we are producing an Astra resource model that is describing the infrastructure, and an Astra application model which is describing 
the application we want to deploy in that infrastructure. Both models uh, will be concretized by the IC builder, which will provide the um, ultimate uh, deployment artifact, which is uh, Tosca Blueprint. So the technology for deployment we are adopting is Tosca. However, the modeling uh, approaches we are adopting tries to uh, start a little bit from Tosca, and I will, I will go for more details in, in the next slides. So this Tosca Blueprint could be optimized at the level of application or at the level of infrastructure or the level of the topology, and the optimized um, artifacts are deployed, actually deployed. So this is the general um, uh, method. And be more precise about the modeling layer, the different uh, user or different roles we are supporting are using the IDE. And for in other, uh, you know, uh, in other uh, hand, we have a um, repository of um, resources and components that can be reused in order to create this application deployment topology. These uh, interfaces, uh, these uh, resources and components are um, include, uh, um, described within a semantic knowledge base. So all the information about these resources uh, and components can be extracted by uh, the um, knowledge inference and reasoning capabilities of the knowledge base. So in particular, uh, all the sources and components can be reused and can be presented to the user in the IDE. Also, uh, additional knowledge, additional content that is required in order to create these uh, models can also be presented to the user on demand in a context-aware uh, fashion. And uh, the knowledge base and the inference capabilities of the knowledge base can also, also be used to uh, validate the models provided by the user before they are used uh, in order to support the actual deployment. The knowledge base will be also used in order to improve the utilization of the, uh, of the models, I mean, deployment models, together with some um, optimization components that we have in the backend. And once the, the models have been created, they can be populated in the knowledge base in order to be reused by other um, users in another modeling um, activities. But we can also uh, use the submitting model in order to be deployed. And in that part is where the IC infrastructure takes place to uh, deploy the model within the runtime. And this will be a part of the presentation, next presentation um, conducted by Elizabeth. So in terms of domain specific languages that we have created, it depends on the, um, the purpose of the uh, modeling purpose. If we are going to model uh, infrastructure resources, and is, we are going to target or, or to um, interface uh, the resource expert, we, are, we have created a resource meta model, which is being used to describe uh, infrastructure resources, reusable infrastructure resources. If we are addressing the application of experts to define application deployment topologies, we uh, have defined an application, the faster application deployment uh, model, which um, refers to modeling entities included within the resource model. Additionally, the application of expert can create optimization models that are used in order to uh, fine tune the performance of concrete components within the uh, complex application. Therefore, uh, the asset application deployment meta model is also linking. Uh, these optimization models. Um, last but not least, um, we are also supporting the specification of the um, implementation of the operation of interfaces that are adopted by some components in the uh, complex application. By uh, describing this uh, um, operation uh, implementation in Ansible. So we have defined as well an uh, Ansible meta model for supporting this uh, specification. Uh, as the ultimate uh, objective is to create uh, Tosca deployment artifacts, um, we have designed both the Astro uh, application deployment model and the source model in a way that they borrow uh, from Tosca uh, a significant number of modeling elements. We don't want to uh, create a completely new uh, modeling languages that are 
not quite um, uh, separated from the, the Tosca uh, concepts in order to simplify for the users the adoption of this model, uh, these meta models, and also uh, in order to simplify the conversion from these uh, models into the uh, target Tosca blueprint. Uh, and the technology we have adopted in order to create, or to design, and to create all these meta models is XTEX, which is a um, um, framework for creating DSLs and textual editors uh, based on Eclipse modeling framework. And it's part of the impressive model driven uh, engineering um, landscape of tools in the Eclipse ecosystem. So in terms of editors, we have created textual editors using XText for all these uh, meta models. The benefits of adopting textual modeling is mostly uh, efficiency. Uh, is that this textual modeling is um, enabling very fast prototyping, very fast modeling. But one of the drawbacks is that it requires uh, skill, the modelers. Uh, but also, we have also adopted the, an approach in which for the same model, we are able to provide different viewpoints. Apart from the textual view, viewpoint, we can also uh, provide a graphical viewpoint. We can provide graphical editors as well. The benefits of adopting graphical editors is that the complexity of adopting a modeling is lower, although uh, the performance, I mean, the efficiency of modeling is uh, uh, also lower. I mean. So if we want high efficiency of modeling, we can opt for uh, adopting textual edition. If we want to communicate the models uh, between partitioners, much better to offer a uh, graphical viewpoint. But provided we are um, working with the same model, um, I mean, core model, every change in any uh, representation of the model is in sync. So it's automatically propagated to the other uh, viewpoint. So the textual editors are offering the same kind of feature that you can find in many uh, editors for the most popular programming languages. So the experience is pretty much the same as if you are uh, creating uh, Java or Python code, offering syntax scoring, uh, content assistance, uh, the completion, the possibility to use templates, block templates, and so on. Uh, here is an example of the ID in which we have for the same model, uh, the textual and visual representation, both are editable. Um, and the user can opt for using one or another and any, any change in one of the models is automatically uh, rendered in, the, in, the, in another model. But also we can also provide um, other, other representations of the, of the same model. For instance, here is an outline which is a three-based three representation of the model. Uh, we have in mind to provide additional graphical representations, for instance, for describing workflow, um, the workflow, uh, I mean, to describe the application uh, topologies as a workflow topology, or other views that could be um, identified by our stakeholders. As commented, textual editor has been created with text text, and the graphical editor has been created by using CDUs framework, which is a framework for creating a graphical editor for DSLs as well in the context of Eclipse. So all these uh, editors together constitute what we call the uh, Smart ID for Sodalite, which is providing some uh, intelligent support, <clears throat> intelligent support in the sense of um, assisting the user in uh, creating the model by providing modeling templates, by suggesting uh, modeling entities that can be applied in a particular context. So every, every suggestion is context aware. We can also support uh, retrieving knowledge from the knowledge base. Uh, um, so all the infrastructure know-how from the knowledge base can be presented to the user at the point where it's needed um, for any aspect that could be any information that could be retrieved from the knowledge base. Even we can use the knowledge base inference capabilities in order to determine, uh, for instance, resources or components can satisfy some particular requirements expressed by uh, some of the components of the complex application that is being modeled. Um, 
And also another uh, concept that we implemented in the model was the idea of uh, modularization. So we can combine um, uh, resources, components within a particular domain, for instance, Docker or OpenStack domain. And then uh, we can inform uh, the, the model, which are the models that we are interested in, in a similar way in which that is being done in the context of programming languages. So we can um, restrict the search in the knowledge base to only those uh, infrastructure resources that we are interested in. At level, of, uh, at level of validation, model validation, we are supporting both syntactic validation. Uh, so we are checking the conformance of the model uh, to the uh, DSL. And we are also supporting um, semantic validation. The, the uh, knowledge base can inspect the model, can provide hints, suggestions, uh, recommendations in order to improve the model, and even complete some aspects of the model before being deployed. So to summarize the innovative aspects that we have adopted in this uh, modeling approach, uh, we are explicitly um, uh, supporting these basic concerns in modeling for the different uh, modeling purposes and for supporting the different modeling roles. We are adopting a multi-view representation in which we have both textual, graphical, uh, view, representation, view point representation of the same model always in sync uh, in sync um, we are also providing context aware content assistance for model authoring so assisting the user in creating the model by retrieving knowledge from the uh, share repository the knowledge base which is also uh, providing us uh, semantic validation and recommendations during the validation process and as a Modeling um, addition of extensions to the existing Tosca representation of uh, deployment topologies, we are supporting the optimization of um, compass application as well as the Ansible specification of supported operations in the life cycle of components. In terms of uh, related work, we are aware of uh, different uh, existing solutions. The two more mature, in our opinion, are Winery and Alien for Cloud. Winery is a um, web based graphical editor for Tosca Blueprints, which is embedded within Eclipse. And Alien for Cloud is a complete suite that also includes a uh, graphical editor for uh, Tosca, but supports the entire Tosca deployment. And there are others listed here. All of them are Tosca specific. All of them are providing graphical notation, uh, graphical editors, and um, they are uh, using relational databases in order to uh, store uh, reusable components. And that's it from my side. Hey, you have interest in having a look to the Soda Line modeling framework. Um, and also additional information about Sodali, you can go to this GitHub repository and you, where you can install it and you can play with it. And thank you so much for your attention. I thank you, Jesus. Answer question if there is any. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, are there any questions for us? I don't see uh, any in the in the chat. Uh, my my question was was very much about where do I find more information about the IDE? Thank you very much. Your final okay. slide answered my, <laughs> answer, answered my question. Answer the question. Okay, right. thank you so much. How many, yes, how many, uh, how, how much time is left for Sodalite until the end of the project? One year. One year, all right. Oh, those plenty, plenty, plenty of time then to do more work. And yeah. then hopefully we will, uh, you will, you will come back next year with more things to share. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jesus. Thank you. So our next presentation is uh, from uh, Elisabetta on uh, from application design to orchestrated execution in heterogeneous environments. Uh, to you, Elisabetta, if you are able to share your screen. Yes, sure. Just one second. I'm uh, take your time. Screen. <coughs> okay. 
So I was trying to switch on my camera first and I'm going to share a screen. Okay, so maybe the, I'm not sure that you see my camera on. We can see, yeah, yeah, we can see you your see? slides. Ah, okay, yeah. so this is important. The camera is not so important. Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I was trying to switch it on, but for some reason I cannot uh, switch it on. So apologies for this. Sorry. Okay. So anyhow, uh, let me start. So my presentation is the last one about uh, uh, soda light, but it actually tries to uh, provide a general overview. So in some sense today, we decided to try this experiment. It's the first time we tried, I mean, to give the overview at the end after uh, providing uh, some details about the runtime and, uh, uh, and the design environment uh, for, uh, for soda light. So let me see if uh, this works. So uh, essentially uh, here we, we show, we try to show the kind of uh, uh, applications uh, that we would like to target uh, as, uh, let's say, uh, uh, subjects of uh, uh, our tool set. So essentially, we are, uh, we are aiming at uh, handling uh, applications that are composed of multiple components. Here we see an, an example of one of our case study that is uh, uh, composed of uh, um, uh, three, let's say, uh, macro components. Each of them uh, can be split in a number of uh, different subcomponents, and each subcomponent is uh, uh, a specific process, essentially, uh, or a service, depending on the configuration that we, uh, that we offer. So the specific purpose of this application is uh, to uh, perform uh, analysis uh, um, aiming at uh, quantifying the amount of water that is available in a certain area. So this quantification uh, is uh, uh, made starting from pictures. Uh, in particular, uh, we uh, want to focus on the on how much water we have a, re, a reserve of water. So we uh, check the snow on the mountains in certain areas. And uh, uh, based on the uh, amount of snow that we can quantify from pictures, uh, we are able to provide an estimation of uh, the uh, uh, reserve of water that we have in that area or the scarcity of water if, uh, if you want. And so essentially, uh, the, this case study is focusing on uh, image processing. Um, so we collect these images, and we can collect these images from multiple sources. We can have uh, images coming from webcams, images coming from uh, um, uh, websites like uh, uh, the ones that are available to post pictures. So essentially, uh, we uh, crawl that website and uh, uh, we can uh, collect uh, all pictures that are relevant to our analysis. So we need to select uh, from a large am amount of pictures the ones that are interesting for us, so the ones concerning a specific area and, uh, uh, and of course, mountains on that area. And so in the end, what we do is uh, uh, given a, a database of images, uh, we uh, um, try to uh, filter them uh, and uh, identify those uh, that are uh, representative of a certain area. So for instance, here on the right hand side, you see that there are uh, multiple images that are referring to the same uh, area. And we select the one that allow us to uh, have a more clear view of uh, uh, what we call the skyline. Uh, and uh, given the skyline that, the, in, that we can see uh, from a certain picture at a certain point in time, and comparing this skyline with the skyline of the same mountain without snow, we can understand essentially the amount of snow and uh, make an estimation uh, concerning the amount of water that is there. So uh, anyway, besides the specific uh, uh, application domain that we are considering, the point is that uh, here we have, uh, a, a, let's say, a set of pipelines of uh, uh, components. Uh, and uh, uh, this pipeline can be combined uh, uh, together. And uh, uh, the way these uh, components uh, 
and uh, uh, these sub pipelines uh, can be combined together can vary uh, depending on uh, the configuration that we can uh, can, can decide so for instance uh, in this figure here uh, we have a situation in which the two uh, pipelines uh, that produce uh, data uh, for the main pipelines pipeline that is dedicated to data processing are storing images uh, on a database and then these images are uh, 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 queried from uh, uh, by the data processing uh, component that will then uh, perform uh, the work. Uh, and so we, we can also, in this configuration, we are assuming uh, that there are some cron jobs that start uh, the, the crawling of uh, pictures and uh, start capturing images from the webcam. And these are the starting points for the two uh, small pipelines that you see on the left hand side that will feed the uh, database with images. And then uh, in this configuration, we are also assuming that uh, on the, uh, the pipeline on the right hand side uh, works uh, uh, according to a pipeline filter approach. So essentially uh, one component is producing uh, some outputs that are given as input to the next uh, component. Uh, but of course we can imagine also uh, other types of uh, um, organizations as we see uh, in the next slide. Uh, the other thing that we highlight, uh, highlight here is that uh, uh, some of the components that you see here um, involve some machine learning. So for instance, the Skyline Extractor is one of these components that uh, has uh, um, some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, compute specific uh, uh, computational requirements due to the fact that uh, it needs to be trained. And so during the training phase, uh, it will require uh, quite a large amount of resources. And this suggests us that, for instance, that specific uh, component, and in particular the training of that component, uh, can be uh, performed uh, on, uh, for instance, in high performance computing resource, while the actual uh, execution of the platform could work uh, pretty easily uh, on uh, um, a normal set of virtual machines, for instance, on the cloud. And this suggests the fact that we want to handle um, resources that are heterogeneous. And uh, we also want to make sure that these uh, heterogeneous resources can uh, cooperate uh, and can transfer data back and forth so that the various parts of the system uh, work together uh, in a proper way. So uh, in this other slide, we have uh, essentially the same architecture, but we uh, highlight a possible, a different uh, configure, a possible different configuration of this uh, application. Uh, in particular, in this case, instead of having uh, on the right hand side, the components organized in a pipe and filter approach, we have them organized uh, as a set of uh, services. Uh, that are uh, uh, called by a GRU component, that is the data processing component, uh, that is uh, essentially orchestrating uh, their execution. So the, our uh, problems, uh, uh, given this application, which in the end is quite simple, but already uh, introduces a number of uh, uh, technical problems, is uh, uh, to understand how we can help uh, the developers of these applications uh, in uh, uh, organizing the application in the right way. So for instance, in our specific case, uh, our case study providers uh, are experts in the algorithms that are behind uh, these uh, uh, image processing uh, uh, jobs. Um, so they know how to uh, manage them, uh, but they don't know too much how to manage uh, the integration between the various pieces, the, uh, their deployment on uh, actual resources, etc. So for instance, uh, in the initial version of this case study, uh, all uh, the algorithmic parts uh, were available, uh, but our uh, partners uh, were uh, uh, essentially executing uh, each individual piece by hand. 
So they were executing manually, uh, for instance, the crawling. And then uh, uh, when the crawling was uh, ending, they were uh, taking uh, the, the, the files uh, that were clawed, that were essentially images, and then they were storing them in some database uh, so that then the other components uh, could be executed again manually uh, to do some other part of the processing. So essentially, the general goal of uh, uh, SodaLite is to help uh, people uh, who are expert in a specific application domain in uh, addressing uh, these uh, specific problems. So how to put the various pieces together, how to make sure that they can be executed in the best possible way. Uh, so uh, here, for instance, we are highlighting that, uh, as I mentioned before, some components, uh, in this case, the training uh, could uh, uh, go on HPC while other components uh, uh, could go on, uh, on the cloud, maybe on uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, virtual machines, uh, possibly with some load balancing mechanism uh, in front of uh, uh, some of them. So uh, the problems that we are facing is uh, uh, how expensive is for a non-IT intensive company to handle the deployment of these complex applications, to manage the executions of this uh, complex application, trying to understand, for instance, uh, uh, the performance and try to uh, fine tune performance, that, try to understand how much they spend in terms of resources, trying to monitor and so on and so forth. And especially the most important aspect for us is to make the process replicable. So to be able to uh, um, perform a new deployment and a new uh, uh, and to automate the execution of the various parts of the application uh, also uh, multiple times uh, in uh, different uh, uh, possible situations. So of course, uh, uh, we know that there are multiple tools that allow us to support automation. Uh, the problem, however, is that there might be too many as uh, this figure tries to suggest. This figure is from Xevia Labs and essentially uh, gives the idea that the amount of tools that we have available for multiple uh, tasks that are somehow related to the uh, automation of uh, uh, deployment, configuration, provisioning, etc., is uh, really very high. So uh, the issues that we uh, face uh, is also that whenever we use uh, one of the available tools or a, or a set of available tools, uh, what we need to do is to program the way the system must be deployed, must be configured, must be executed. Uh, so we need to write new pieces of code uh, that are quite complex uh, themselves. Um, if uh, we need to use a special purpose resources as, uh, uh, for instance, the HPC resources could be, then uh, we need to have uh, experts uh, of that resources, and typically application experts are not uh, experts of that kind of resources. Uh, the other problem that we are facing is that different types of resources uh, offer different APIs, uh, different access control mechanisms. And so uh, essentially uh, our uh, objective in SodaLite is to try to cope at least partially uh, with the problems that I mentioned. So try to uh, enable simpler and faster development of infrastructural code and uh, uh, deployment and execution of heterogeneous application on multiple resources. So uh, you have seen in uh, Yoso's presentation, uh, our uh, um, editing, our development support environment. Uh, and uh, uh, as you have seen, uh, we have put special care in making sure that uh, at least in trying to improve the, the, the way, uh, uh, how try to simplify, let's say, the way uh, applications are, the way the deployment of application is uh, uh, designed. Uh, and uh, you have also seen from Indica's presentation that we uh, have some uh, support also at runtime uh, for uh, uh, reconfiguration uh, purposes. Uh, you have already seen this figure, so I'm uh, not going uh, to spend uh, additional time for this, except to mention that, uh, uh, of course, we have a, a part in which, uh, a phase in which we uh, conceive 
uh, the, um, a model for the deployment of our application. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, some steps uh, that are uh, uh, automatic that generate a, a blueprint, the Tosca blueprint given uh, our uh, uh, deployment model. We call it our abstract application deployment model. Uh, we have some optimization mechanisms that are especially suited for uh, the case in which some parts of the application need to be deployed on uh, HPC. And then we have the deployment step. And uh, uh, at runtime, of course, we have the monitoring step and the uh, runtime optimization. Uh, and we enter into a loop uh, that allows us to uh, improve uh, the execution of uh, uh, the application. Uh, as you will see later on, uh, actually, we have two uh, different types of uh, optimization, runtime optimization loops. I will go uh, into this uh, in a minute. So as for the uh, smart uh, um, support to the development of a deployment model, we have already seen. So I'm just recalling you that essentially we try to offer a mechanism uh, and set of suggestions that uh, allow us to uh, avoid the trivial errors by the users, such as the case in which I want to deploy a database schema or an, on a Tomcat, for instance, that, and of course, this doesn't make sense. And we have also uh, some uh, um, automation mechanism that uh, allow us to um, infer from uh, the way the user define a certain uh, system uh, that, uh, for instance, we need to create a network uh, between two hosts and therefore some part of the infrastructure as code can be inferred and can be uh, attached to the, uh, to the deployment model that is cr being created by the user uh, in an automated way. We, another problem that is also, uh, that we feel is also quite important is that uh, uh, in uh, contexts such as uh, uh, the ones that are Tosca based that tries to be that try to be as generic as possible and try to be as comprehensive as, pos as possible in terms of uh, the resources that they are able to handle uh, one problem that we face is that these resources must be described so we in Tosca we need to define uh, uh, specific Tosca types for each new type of resource that we want to incorporate uh, and uh, uh, also in our uh, uh, specific uh, uh, modeling context, uh, we need to define uh, what we call resource models that then map essentially to the Tosca types. Uh, so with this uh, uh, automatic discovery mechanism, what we try to do is to um, essentially avoid that a human being must go through an extensive uh, modeling step for what concerns the, the, the resources. No? And so uh, we infer a model of the resources uh, starting from uh, uh, what is available uh, in terms of uh, actual resources. So we have a discovery mechanism that uh, querying the various uh, um, resource providers that we can exploit uh, is able to uh, then generate the corresponding models, uh, so the, the Tosca types essentially, that correspond to uh, that resources. Um, as I mentioned before, we have this uh, uh, application optimization, um, but I'm not going to spend time on it. And then uh, finally, for what concerns the runtime optimization, Indica has uh, uh, mentioned uh, what we call the refactor, so the ability essentially to uh, modify uh, the uh, Tosca specification uh, to change, to redeploy essentially part of uh, the application in a different way. Uh, the other approach that we have uh, for what concerns runtime optimization is based on uh, control theory uh, and uh, is uh, essentially a mechanism to perform vertical scaling um, in which uh, um, the uh, vertical scaling is not triggered by according to a rule-based approach as, as in the typical uh, solutions, but is triggered uh, uh, by a, um, an algorithm that is uh, uh, driven uh, by a control theory model. So essentially here we, we show that we have uh, 
an architecture uh, that is based on two essential components, the dispatcher and the controllers. The dispatcher is the one that sends uh, uh, requests for executing tasks on uh, uh, multiple resources. So we uh, have experiments with GPUs and CPUs that are used together. Uh, and then we have some controllers uh, that uh, uh, execute this uh, control theoretical model and make, make decisions about how to perform this uh, vertical scaling. Uh, and we have uh, an evaluation, we have developed an extensive evaluation of this uh, uh, tool that we call uh, Node Manager. And essentially these graphs show that uh, our approach performs uh, better than a, a basic rule-based approach. So here in these graphs, uh, our approach is on the left-hand side, uh, a rule-based approach is on the right-hand side, and the uh, figures show that uh, based on our approach, we never go over the, um, the thresholds that are fixed, that are the dotted lines, uh, while in the case of the rule-based approach, there is always a, a very strong oscillation, and uh, uh, there is this tendency of uh, uh, essentially breaking the SLA that is defined by these uh, thresholds. Um, we have uh, uh, tested uh, our uh, uh, framework uh, uh, on multiple infrastructures, so we are able to handle at the moment resources uh, from AWS, from OpenStack, Kubernetes, uh, and then Torkens Larm uh, for what concerns uh, um, HPC. Uh, and uh, we have uh, we are using uh, some uh, test beds. Uh, one of them is Atatos, uh, based essentially based on OpenStack. Another one uh, focusing on uh, the usage of Torque is uh, at HLRS, that is another partner of the project. And then we are also using EGI, which is uh, a, a European initiative offering a specific uh, set of uh, infrastructure. So it, it is essentially an infrastructure provider uh, for us. Uh, in terms of uh, use cases, we have three use cases. One is the one that I mentioned, we call it a snow use case. And then another one is on uh, uh, IoT and the connection between uh, edge networks and the cloud. And the third one is uh, uh, focusing on scientific workflows uh, and uh, is the one essentially mostly focusing on HPC. So uh, thank you for your attention. I forgot to keep track of time, so I hope I am. I didn't spend too much time. No, no, that, that's fine, Elisabetta. Thank you for your talk. Thanks again for your presentation. Uh, do we have any questions for Elisabetta? Looks like only QA. a no. Uh, just maybe more a confirmation than a question, Elisabetta. When you talked about the automatic discovery, right? You, uh, you mentioned resource providers, but at the same time, I would expect that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would expect that at the same time, this, the, it will automatically work whether you are in an HPC environment, a cloud or an edge. Yes, of course. Yeah. So okay. we are, uh, for us, a resource provider is also a provider of an HPC cluster. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then is that the list that you have presented later on in a few, a few slides ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yes, are, uh, trying, we are discovering also resources that are on uh, an HPC cluster. Not okay. yet the ones that are at the edge, but the plan is to go also in that direction. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Again, I, I think with the EGI, uh, I, if, the, if the acronym is right, is the European Grid Initiative or something? Uh, I, I think so. I'm not. Yeah, because again, it's, it's, a, it's there for historical reasons. Yeah, it is actually a, again, it is a resource. It is so known as a resource provider because the, the infrastructure is there and still maintained. Yeah, 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 and uh, and uh, so th that's why we are uh, discussing with them, and we are we have uh, started doing some experiments on uh, that infrastructure to see. Yeah at least that what we are doing is not tied to our test beds. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to you. All right. Thank so, you. yes, thank you. And uh, the last presentation of uh, this afternoon 
is going to be given by myself. I'm just going to share with you some slides. Um, yeah. If you could see my slide, uh, that would be uh, great. Yes, yes, we see. Yes, we see excellent. That. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> this is a, a, a presentation which was, uh, which is basically, um, uh, is going to be given in the context of a project, a European project that was actually completed uh, some time ago. It, it's called Tango. And, and the reason I am giving this presentation today is because uh, the research that we have done at the end of that project has never been presented in any workshop or conference or symposium. It went straight into a journal paper. So, so this year we said, well, why not take this opportunity and, uh, and, 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 uh, and present this, uh, th these results? Uh, the, and, and, and what's interesting is that I was actually uh, 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 given the same presentation yesterday at the uh, at the help BL workshop, and again because it was again it was a sort of timing issue, and uh, I did not really have the time to present a complete well to prepare a completely new presentation. Anyway, here I am. Uh, this is work that has been uh, that is on energy aware self adaptation for application execution on heterogeneous parallel architectures. Just to acknowledge that this uh, work has been. Uh, uh, has been done with colleagues from the University of Leeds, that's uh, Richard Kavna and the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Rosa Badia and uh, Jorge Yark, and also uh, Atos, uh, David, uh, David Garcia Perez, uh, now who's actually uh, worked in, the, in a different uh, company. So uh, I would like to start with the research context, a quick motivation, a reference architecture, the concept of self-adaptation and how self-adaptation is supported by the programming model in a heterogeneous computing environment and some experiments and results and a quick conclusion. All right, so uh, you have seen this slide uh, maybe before at the start where we introduced again the, the, uh, the overall progress with, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the Alliance work. Uh, we live in a work where we have constantly new disruptive applications. This could be cyber physical systems, cyber physical systems of systems, HPC, wearable computing, you name them. So these applications tend to run on various platforms that themselves could be heterogeneous. It could be a, a, a typical HPC, it could be a cloud, it could be a grid, it could be a cluster, it could be your mobile phone, it could be anything. And finally, down in the, in the, uh, down in the, in the bottom layer, you will see the heterogeneous hardware well, again, this time, these days is very much jungle. You've got all the CPUs, the GPUs, the multi-core, the many-core, the arrays, the FPGAs, and, and certainly more, uh, uh, more recently with the advent of, uh, of, of multiple FPGAs in, in a single board. So the, 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 uh, of course, the, the challenge for, for everyone, uh, for, for everyone is, is to try to find or maybe design uh, more flexible software abstractions potentially improve system architecture in order to exploit the benefits of the heterogeneity. Again, heterogeneity could be from the software level, from the, from the hardware level, it could, be, it, it could be actually anything. So um, let's focus in this talk really on the, on, the, on the programming side of things in the sense that if you are a, a programmer, you may have your own way of programming and potentially deploying your applications on this heterogeneous uh, architecture. So, the task might be difficult, but more importantly, what if you are not a computer scientist and you are given this task? The other thing is that it's certainly very difficult to understand what is going on, especially during execution and at runtime of the application. And potentially you could have the choice of running an application on a CPU or on a GPU or on a CPU and a GPU, but you don't know what is fast. And it could be, it could be potentially faster uh, if you, or, or, or maybe consume less energy. The reason is that these uh, applications also may, be, uh, may tend to, 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 to be deployed in a low power or a low energy environment. So you can potentially think about tuning your application for each architecture or cluster. You can partition the data among the nodes. You can think about the data locality. You can talk about the scheduling and all that. So uh, as part of this uh, European project, uh, which again was completed uh, some time ago, we, we had Tango and with its reference architecture that said, well, let's take a, a top-down top approach 
where you have a layered architecture that brings together people interested, of course, in the in an IDE, let, potentially uh, some requirements in design tooling, a programming model, some form of code profiling, it tells you very much about how the application is doing in this heterogeneous environment. And then think about some form of middleware where you could uh, deploy your application, uh, place your, 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 your application, your tasks, your workflows, consider potentially energy and performance requirement, potentially trade-offs on this target heterogeneous para architecture. Think about an application lifecycle deployment engine, think about uh, a monitoring infrastructure, think about maybe a self-adaptation, a self-adaptation system or, or component that would ensure that your application always gets the quality of service that it needs once deployed on these architectures. And finally, you would have what we call the, the, the fabric, the heterogeneous parallel device management. Again, in, that pro, in the project itself, we certainly consider the CPUs, the GPUs, and the FPGAs. So what's interesting about this architecture is that you can have your own workflow, starting from IDE down to the middleware, down to the fabric. You can actually pick and choose the components that you would like to, 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 to use, for example, to deploy an HPC application or to deploy an IoT application or to deploy an embedded system application. So again, all these tools have been, again, are, are available on, uh, on, on, our, on our GitHub. So uh, today, uh, when I mentioned this, uh, this, uh, this self-adaptation and how at runtime an, an application can actually adapt to the environment where it runs, uh, you can do it through the programming model itself, or you can actually do it through the self-adaptation manager at the middleware level. So this talk today is about the programming model uh, uh, support of self-adaptation. Do we have, of course, this journal paper where uh, all the, the work, we, all the research we've done on self-adaptation from the programming model perspective and the self-adaptation management perspective is actually in the same, uh, in, in, on the same paper. So let's focus on the programming model. Very much, very quickly, we, we use the Barcelona Supercomputing Center uh, 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 programming model. It's actually stars, it has comms and ohms. And the most important thing here is that at the end of the day, you would like to have a general purpose task-based single address space programming model, so that again, you will, uh, you will be able again to, 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 uh, to, to, to write your software, to deploy your application to run, but you let the difficult parts to the runtime. Okay, so the runtime itself has somehow the power to again, to, to, to act on your behalf, you the user, you the programmer. So the runtime itself is, is again, is a to, to be intelligent, to understand parallelization, to understand the distribution, to understand the interoperability, and certainly to be able to self-adapt your application at runtime. Okay? So the aspect of monitoring and analysis is, is key here because you will expect your, also your runtime to be able to generate data to evaluate how the application performs. Again, the programming model is agnostic. You can run it on a cloud, you can run it on a cluster, you can run it on, on, a, on, a, on, on an HPC environment. Again, that's why this is very, very, very important. So very quickly, uh, starts from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, the project has been around for some time. You have OMS and COMS as, as the main programming models. They both use code annotations, specifically for task and data di 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 direction. And think about comms as the, high, the very high level of the cluster or, or the cloud or the HPC environment. Think about comms as the intranode where you can talk about task granularity at the, at the level of the, the microsecond and not really core such as comms at the level of the, of, the, of the millisecond. And again, think about dependencies, think about the language bindings such as C, C++, Fortran, and also uh, Java, C, C++, Python for comms. So, at the end of the day, expect your main algorithm to be implemented as a workflow of coarse grain uh, tasks, and each coarse grain task can be implemented as a workflow of fine grain tasks. Okay? So another aspect of the programming model is task versioning, because with task versioning, you will, you will certainly enable this, 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 uh, uh, this adaptation. The, the, the reason is that at the end of the day, you will expect maybe to have an application such as a graph, and the, and the graph uh, will, will, uh, will store valuable information about what the, about the, the workflow is, it actually is. And then you could potentially think about the computational load that is required by the, by the, by the application, depending on the status of the application execution at runtime. Okay? So 
the runtime would then be able to obtain from the graph precise information uh, on and certainly precise estimation on the application computation load. And it, that's very important in terms of exam execution time and potentially in terms of uh, energy, uh, energy uh, consumption. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, very quickly, you can take uh, the main code here is, is a matrix multiplication. You can think about uh, uh, the core, coarse grain task having an interface. This interface says that I may be able to run my application on a CPU or maybe on a GPU. And when it comes to the coarse grain task implementation, again, you should be able to have an implementation for a, for, for a CPU and for a GPU. And then from there, moving to the fine grain uh, task implementation, where you could say, if I have to multiply uh, uh, this, this matrix, these two matrices, I would use the concept again of, uh, of, uh, of for example, I, uh, of, uh, of, of environment or potentially programming language. It could be an MPI, it could be, uh, it could be Java, it could be, uh, uh, it could be a CUDA because of a GPU, et cetera. So the, let's leave this uh, code annotations and constraints and, and, uh, and pragmas again to the programming model to deal, to deal with this. So, you will, of course, have the support of several languages, uh, again, uh, from, from COMS at the coarse grain, as well as the fine grain uh, um, uh, task and their versions. Again, examples of Python, Java, and, and, and certainly MPI applications for HPC. And more importantly, the legacy software. You can take any legacy software as long as you have a binary of that legacy software and then be able to support it through the programming, through the programming model. So, this concept again of task version task uh, is, is, is certainly very important. Think about the workflow, think about tasks, think about the parallelism you can you can capture through the uh, through the uh, through the task per, per, uh, uh, through the task partitioning. Leave to leave to comes uh, the possibility to assign and execute coarse grain tasks in your computing nodes, and leave to 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 OMS the, the 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 management of the intranet level where you manage the intranode heterogeneity itself. All right, so uh, this is certainly, uh, again, something that, that we have, uh, that, that, that has been actually there and, and it's still there. There is quite a substantial amount of, of, of research uh, at the moment on, again, on enhancing this programming model, but think about the self-adaptation support. So the self-adaptation support through the runtime is that the task versioning itself uh, could, be, uh, could be used to, 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 select, to, to select the task to run on different compute, compute nodes according to the available resource configuration. Again, again, as I mentioned earlier, the runtime itself is able again to know where, where uh, about the tasks, where do they run, potentially estimate their execution time. So based on the task parallelism and the monitored data, the runtime could, could auto-scale the resources that are available in your environment according to the required quality for the execution. So in a nutshell, when you think about the adaptation, these are basically the steps that we had to, un to undergo in order to enhance the programming model with self-adaptation. So you take again your code, it comes with annotated methods for input, output, uh, IO data. You take the task versioning, whether it's sequential, multi-threaded, OpenCL, CUDA binaries, you name them. You look at the task dependencies because you have a direct and acyclic graph. And then you let the runtime profile, get the profiling information in terms of task duration, power consumption, energy consumption. Then you make you as, a, as an outcome of this, you will achieve the parallelism that you actually need, but looking at the availability of the heterogeneous resources in your environment. So there are basically two actuators for your self-adaptation manager. You can and you can have less resources than pending tasks. In this case, you execute the pending task on the resource when it becomes available. The application is certainly accelerated up, but, but power and or energy consumption may increase. You could take the second actuators where more resources are available than pending tasks. Then you can uh, reschedule the tasks to use minimum number of resources and potentially reduce the power consumption or the energy consumption. Again, this may lead, lead to an increase in your execution time. Okay, so very quickly, when you take, if you think about the, um, the, all the, the tools that we have developed in the project, you can take the source code from the programming model, you could take the, uh, the, uh, the application uh, deployment engine, you can create a singularity container, for example, and then you can apply the container to the device supervisor. For example, if you are in an HPC environment, you can use Slurm, for example. 
And then again, yeah, think about uh, specifying uh, uh, execution configuration, whether again, this could run on CPUs, GPUs, or a mix of CPUs and GPUs. Again, you let the program, the, the, the runtime to decide where to run these. So uh, very quickly in the second part of this talk, I will, look, I will look at some performance results. Uh, this, uh, we had a, a bull uh, part of Atos, uh, which basically built uh, France uh, as partner and they, uh, uh, they, 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 uh, they, uh, uh, they provided a lot of support uh, in terms of heterogeneous uh, environment. Here is a, an example of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, some uh, uh, nodes we used on their infrastructure. Uh, for example, uh, infrastructure made of uh, Intel Xeon uh, Sandy Bridges, uh, NVDA uh, Kepler's, Intel Xeon Phi, and, and also um, so, um, some uh, double compute blades, very much Intel Xeon uh, as well. Quite a sub substantial, well, heterogeneity in the environment itself. So when you would like to, to evaluate the programming model and its runtime uh, and how it can perform the, 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 the so-called self-adaptation, we use an HPC application that Gromax, you may be aware of, it's a molecular dynamic simulation package. And in addition to Gromax, we implemented uh, uh, PyMedi setup, which is a, 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 a tool on top of, uh, uh, written in Python on top of Gromax very much to facilitate the setup and the execution of the systems specifically for modular dynamic simulation for example how many uh, protein mutations you would like to see here and there so we took we took the a very early uh, uh, ex experiment where we used two protein mutation on the left hand side you will see the task uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 tasks within the application and the inherent parallelism that is captured by the by the actual uh, runtime and you could see here that for example if you use uh, 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 CPUs and GPUs you can expect again uh, um, uh, to execute this version on eight CPUs and one GPU and have a time an execution time of 150.49 uh, second and consume 53.4 uh, kilojoule however the the same the same, the, the same um, uh, um, uh, task versioning run, run on 24 CPUs will obviously give you different, uh, different, uh, uh, different results. So the task version itself is automatically selected by the runtime and the adaptation does not require any change in the code. So what becomes interesting that if you move from four to six to eight to 10 uh, mutations, it becomes interesting that at the end of the day, you will expect the, the, the self-adaptation manager to say, wait a minute, are you, are you looking at minimizing the execution time, potentially, uh, potentially minimizing energy or potentially ending up with, with more energy consumed or the other way around? If you run in, an, in a low power, low, low energy environment, you may have as a constraint, I would like to, 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 to save on energy, even if I, if I have to run my execution longer. So, just with this different uh, uh, Gromax pipeline, what was interesting is that the, the programming itself would decide at a, to, at a time to use less or more resources depending on this constraint. So if I take here uh, in the first graph where we have four uh, mutations, again, the programming model didn't, do, didn't have to do anything. Whereas with eight uh, mutations, it had actually to scale down to three resources. And whereas for, uh, uh, yes, for, for eight mutations, it had actually had to scale down to three, to, to, to three resources. I'll tell you a little bit more wh why this one here. So, so the runtime in itself would need to add up the resources used by the application according to the execution. So in here, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the runtime uh, looking at the parallel workload was, was able to, 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 um, to, to have a clear uh, uh, information about the expected time to execute the, the, uh, the dependency free task in every evaluation interval, okay? So what, the way it does it again, it has to combine the number of tasks, their duration and resource availability. So the actuator scale up, scale down here, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, with, with specifically for this, uh, for this example, it started with four uh, resources and it has basically to scale down basically to three. So, if you take 20 mutations, uh, you can, uh, as, a, as, as, as an end user, set what we call time constraint or energy constraint. You could actually specify that in the configuration file. 
And then you can start with two resources and let the programming model again do, do take the decision on how on whether to scale up or down. So if there are no constraints on time and energy, but you put, uh, uh, for example, uh, a constraint in terms of sorry, no time or no energy, you can expect, for example, the runtime to decide to use five nodes and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and consume 707 kilojoule in, in 427 seconds, or again, look at, the, uh, look at uh, uh, using only two nodes, but take longer time and certainly less energy. So you could potentially put constraint on the time and the energy itself, if you decide that the maximum energy you, you would like to consume is 700 kilojoule, you let the runtime again to look at the, uh, to, uh, to execute your, your, your application within 559 seconds on four nodes, or you, if you put a deadline of 800 seconds and you would like again to, uh, you could expect your, your, uh, your, uh, your runtime to run, to use three nodes, but again, uh, um, uh, uh, take 751 seconds to do that. So, do you were able again to, to have to have this this uh, the, the possibility again to let the runtime to decide on your behalf depending on the constraint you may have in your environment. So uh, this is very much a, a quick uh, uh, I will say uh, conclusion on what we have done again very much specifically for the for the for the programming model and and its uh, and its runtime. Uh, it's very easy to integrate this with, with legacy uh, uh, applications, MPI, CUDA, OpenCL. It's usable in different environments. And again, uh, the support of self-adaptation is key, especially if you have, if you are, if you are in need for an elastic resource usage. For example, uh, uh, it could be in an HPC environment, it could be in an age environment, it could be in any, uh, any environment you can think of. Okay, so, uh, one last thing, uh, still ongoing research at BSC, uh, very much uh, on, on, the, on, on extending this, for example, in the world of FPGAs, how, how to consider multiple kernels in FPGA and multi-FPGA multi, multi environments. We have also a use case that comes with the, that came with the project. We had an embedded systems use case, an HPC use case, uh, and and again uh, and and uh, and and what was also interesting is that we are implementing uh, this uh, at, at present in an edge IoT computing environment, very much looking at resource reliability. Thank you for your uh, thank you for uh, listening, and I'm happy to uh, to answer any questions you may have. Let me bring it here. Uh yeah uh yes Hello. thank hi thanks for the talk i think it's very relevant for the solar light uh i have one question about that uh uh self adaptation so yes. it's a uh, scope of the adaptation is about uh optimization optimizing uh, like hpc workflows yeah it, it, it could yes it could be let me bring it here yes so so yes it could be the reason it, the, re the reason why it works with hpc workload Okay, I'm going to write it here, is because this architecture here that we have proposed as part of the project can is, is generic enough in the sense if you are an HPC, uh, if you are in H, if you work in HPC and you have an HPC application, again, you can start with the programming model, right? Move into the application lifecycle here, right? Where very much very much the, where you can deploy your application. Talk about the device to, to the device supervisor, which is by the, well, in the use case we have used, which is Slurm, and then run your your, your application again. It could be at a CPU, GPU, or CPU, GPU together. So you let then the programming model to decide how the self adaptation works. If you don't want to do to do it through the programming model, there is another way to do it, which is very much about the self adaptation manager here, very much. As I, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you could have a map uh, approach where you monitor the data, you analyze the data, you plan, you plan, you execute, and you potentially you learn from, 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 pre from, previous, uh, from previous actions. Now, the data that this self-adaptation manager tend to, um, tend to uh, collect over time becomes an asset because you can use then potentially machine learning algorithm in order again to do better scheduling in the future. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, about the programming model, uh, yes. because in the Sodalite, uh, we have programming model. Uh, we don't consider the low level programming. So we have the Tosca or infrastructure as a code level programming. Yeah. Uh, about your programming model, uh, it seemed like uh, at the low level, like Java or C++. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. yeah. So no, I'm thinking about whether we, we can use similar concept at the Tosca or that kind of level. In, it's an interesting, yeah. It 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 is an interesting question. I am I am aware. I'm, I'm aware of some uh, of maybe initiatives around the years of 2013, 2014, when we were working on cloud computing, where there was a similar interest. Okay, so especially with Tosca, Tosca was ext extensively used. Uh, by a number of EU, pro EU projects at that time. And uh, I, I, you may, we may be able to find something, a bridge towards the, towards the programming languages themselves. But again, it's an interesting question. In, in Tango, we, again, we, I have to say that we were very much looking at uh, the sort of uh, uh, Python, Java, MPI, binary, uh, CUDA, of course. Uh, yes, that's what we did. But again, it's, 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 it's an interesting question. I, I may be aware to point to some EU projects around the 2013, 2014, which had again similar uh, similar interest, especially with Tosca. Yeah, if you can share that yes, information yeah, with us, yeah. good. Uh, uh, another question, but not relevant for this. Uh, yeah. At the Sodalite project, we also uh, doing a survey of uh, like uh, system support for heterogeneous application deployment and management. Uh, I noticed that you also have an ACM survey on heterogeneity. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, uh, right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah is you're it right. possible to see the draft because yes. uh, we, we want to avoid any kind of, uh, <laughs> of course, yeah. conflict? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. So, so yeah, it's a bit of history. Uh, we submitted the paper to ACM Computing Survey back in June last year. Okay. We only we only received the reviews uh, this month, uh, first week in January. And, and they were asking us for for some uh, for some changes uh, for some uh, which corrections, which is again, which is what you expect. Yeah. And then uh, and then there is a plan, of course, to to uh, to, uh, to to submit uh, a new a new version of the paper very soon. So yes, I'm happy to share the the draft with you. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Maybe. No, not a yeah. problem. If you just so that we don't forget, if you just drop me an email right now, and I, I can take it, I can take over soon after. Yeah, yeah soon I will do. It. Thank, thank you. Not a problem. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Okay, uh, so here we are. Uh, we are at the end of this uh, of this workshop. I would like, first of all, again to thank uh, everyone for for the talks that we that have been uh, that have been uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, so far uh, given. And again, uh, a, a big thank for for everyone. I would like to take two minutes two minutes before we close everything. Uh, it's just to do with the alliance itself and uh, and and the, and the activities that we may see in the next uh, in, in in the next year. So we are we are running this workshop in High Peak on, on a yearly basis, but it will be certainly important to see more maybe more colleagues involved in the research we do. So important thing we would like to simplify and optimize heterogeneity. The the whole the, the website of the of the alliance can tell you a little bit more about about what we do. Uh, we, we, we take this approach where heterogeneity could be everywhere from the application, from the platform, from the hardware. You can think again about heterogeneity even if you, you take a simple, uh, a, a simple um, uh, hardware component and you say, well, is, is, is this to do with a CPU, a GPU, an accelerator, so that's an FPGA. What about the software itself and heter heterogeneity, operating system, middleware tools, the interconnect asymmetry, the memory hierarchies, Anything that along along that along the heterogeneity is of interest to the to the actual alliance. So again, we've seen this. We would like, obviously, in the research that we do, we would like to to benefit from the heterogeneity of the of the of the fabric, specifically the hardware. Keeping in mind that we would like to make a large number of diverse applications happy, <laughs> in the sense that the benefit is shared by a large number of applications that can take again. Uh, that, can, that can be supported by very heterogeneous hardware. And therefore, we have defined a common architecture and we have already collected a large number of, uh, of, of tools and, 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 uh, and, uh, and certainly uh, 
software in our in our in our repository, which is again available on the uh, on the Alliance website. So the approach is to take a top down uh, a top down uh, uh, top down from design of the application to this construction deployment operation, but at the same time have bring again the aspect of performance, time criticality, real time data movement, security, cost effectiveness, self management. Okay, so that's again very much what the interest of the alliance is, is about. So we have now a large number of uh, number of working groups. The IDE SDK, the middleware, the runtime and systems, the heterogeneous hardware. But alongside of this, we have also working groups that are interested in the aspect of real time, the aspect of HPC, the aspect of embedded systems, and finally, the, the general distributed infrastructure such as clouds, edge, fog. Okay, that's something again that uh, we, we, is, is, uh, we, we thought was very important for, for the Alliance. Another aspect of this is that again, we look at we look at any uh, at the list of catalogs and, and and certainly the tools that we have already collected. The, if you are doing if you are interested in applications such as HPC, big data, cloud, IoT, embedded systems, etc., you will certainly find a tool out there. Maybe at the IDE, maybe the programming model that could be of interest to you. In terms of the middleware, again, a quite a substantial number of tools that could uh, have been pro pro uh, produced by European project. This could be custom uh, custom middleware tools. Could be again uh, anything to do with OpenMP specialized tool. For example, if you are interested in real time uh, middleware, these sort of things. In terms of hardware, so quite a substantial again number of tools that potentially could be could be uh, could be used in the context of of, of, of multi core, many core GPUs, uh, FPGAs, etc. So uh, one aspect of one important aspect of this, if I look at the uh, working group number six, HPC, I thought that at the end of this uh, talk, I will give you maybe one important, uh, uh, I will say, uh, message is in the sense that uh, we, are, uh, we are moving into what we call the exascale. So the, the big question for everyone these days is, are we exascale ready? If you look at the European Commission, if you look at the amount of money put in various projects since 2015, if you look at all the initiatives and the effort of High Peak, again, fantastic effort over the last over the last few years, especially in order again to to, to promote not only again the, uh, the, the 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 software and the hardware and the heterogeneity, uh, the accelerators, the compilers, etc. I think the uh, the aspect of exascale has always been there. So from that regarding again the, the, the concept of exascale again you can we we at the alliance are very much interested in answering a number of questions so how do you maintain and improve programmer productivity in an exascale environment okay so how would you see uh, the next uh, maybe the next version of MPI where you run on a million of course right as as an example uh, how you model and predict performance in an exascale environment. Okay, so next year, in two years' time, when you have a supercomputer that is a truly an exascale computer, and they are coming, how do you how do you how do you how do you prepare for that? How do you ex facilitate the execution of science workflows, especially if you run on a heterogeneous resources? Because the exascale computers are coming again with the CPUs and their GPUs and all sorts of heterogeneous devices here and there. So another aspect of this is potentially is to do not only with how do you manage your resources intelligently in, in, uh, in, in an intelligent way, but how you facilitate maybe map the execution of science workflows on those heterogeneous environment. Again, we are not talking about a thousand of the of, of course, but we may actually, of course, we will be certainly uh, talking about the millions, of course. So maybe uh, one thing that will bring us together again is to share our our uh, our ideas and 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 uh, uh, here and there, and, uh, and 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 certainly look at all the the amount of work that has been done over, over the last few years uh, in terms of the exascale, uh, using this maybe this top down approach from the IDE to the middleware to the runtime to the heterogeneous hardware, and say and 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 ask the big question is are we ready for this. So interesting that uh, yesterday when it was announced that the High Peak Vision 2021 uh, document was uh, was uh, was available, and it's always a pleasure to read to read that document again. Uh, clear indication that 
it is also time for us to consider quantum computing, right? Because it is there, it's coming. So it's not something we can just, uh, we can just ignore. That is uh, very much uh, what I have to say. Uh, maybe in the next, uh, in the next uh, 12 months before we meet again at Hypeg, uh, those of you who are interested in HPC and Exascale uh, could potentially think about uh, how, how, do, how would the applications look like, what are the programming models and runtimes, uh, what, about, what about the middleware itself, and potentially how would an Exascale execution environment knowing that it is by definition very, very heterogeneous. And then to me, the key word here is co-design. You, can, you cannot just do your research uh, in, your, in your own, uh, in, in the corner of your room. You will have to keep, you have to keep talking. And in every, uh, in, 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 uh, maybe through these layers, uh, and trying to, to share ideas and, and to tackle uh, key, key issues and key problems. That is me. Thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, if you have any, uh, maybe a question or any, any quick, uh, I would say, um, uh, comment you would like to make, please do so. Let me go to the question and answer. Hi, Karin. Here, Maria Hello. from Sodalite. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Yeah, uh, this is just a question to verify something. If we have um, created or open new working groups, because I think I missed the last meeting. So yeah. I don't know, I saw new working groups. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, the, so, the work, these working groups, uh, the one that are vertical have, have been around yeah. for some time now. Yes, definitely. Okay. They have been around for some time. I wasn't aware. <laughs> well, about they were probably when we launched when we launched the alliance in Manchester in 2018. We had only the four groups: the the IDE middleware runtime and heterogeneous yeah. hardware. But a year later, it was in Valencia where we we had a, we had a meeting and we decided to have more vertical working groups because of the interest in the uh, in the heterogeneity. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> No problem. So, uh, Thomas, hello. Uh, indeed. I think if you, if it is about the the program, the programming model itself, I, the answer is certainly yes. We can we can certainly do that because the the way the programming model runtime is extended is that again it is it is again it it, it could be it could be maybe a rule to put within the, within with the programming model in, instead of saying well I'm, I'm instead of favoring energy i may again i may i, I may take a different a different scheduling decisions definitely yeah you can you can, we can certainly do that within the programming model that will be my answer Okay, guys. So uh, may, may, may I have a question? This is Martin. Of course, Pearson. you can. Of course, yeah, Go ahead. great. Yeah, <laughs> I would like to ask you because I heard there is an initiative to to create a next um, issue of the Heterogeneity Alliance book. Is there any yes. timeline for it? Because any we're interested. Yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's a good. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. Let me. So Alberto, Alberto, Chomti from from Links in Italy. Uh -huh. has the task to uh, to uh, to bring to the alliance uh, uh, what we call a um, a proposed structure for for our second book okay so i will say that uh, in order to really uh, uh, know how this how the book would what what the contents of the book would would would, would look like and potentially start inviting uh, contributors i will say i may be able to answer that question on Thursday, the 28th of January, where the Alliance uh, members meet again. But Alberto is around, but I don't know if he can speak. Yeah, uh, I can speak. Here you are. Very good. <laughs> yeah, sorry for. <laughs> so so uh... Uh, the proposed structure for the second book, I know you have circulated the draft and, and, and we would like basically to know when we will take a final decision on start inviting maybe contributors. Yeah. Um... I unfortunately, due to pandemic, uh, we still had some uh, uh, some uh, a delay in uh, taking decision. I, I, I have to to um, 
discuss uh, just with uh, Olivia for uh, mm -hmm. for that because uh, mm, the tailor in France is uh, uh, basically asked uh, us to um, due to the pandemic uh, that is still uh, ongoing um, to, to delay it a little bit. Uh, Uh, the, for publication. the publication they, they are they are basically fine uh, with oh. that but um, uh, officially they ask it to um, to to be a little bit patient uh, so I, I am my my plan is to um, to to provide the, to the alliance uh, to the next uh, uh, next uh, meeting uh, yeah. we will have uh, Uh, the the draft of the uh, of the book so basically the 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 content so so that we we have a uh, since Taylor and Francis uh, asked us to um, to let's say slow down a little bit the the, the process of uh, the process, uh, yeah. uh, producing the book uh, I think we have uh, uh, we can uh, you reuse this time for uh, Uh, better shaping the, the, the content. So uh, really understand what we uh, want to put in the book and how to um, tailor the content for uh, not uh, uh, overlapping with the, the previous one or uh, other books uh, uh, that are uh, around the, the, let's say the market. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you, are you is, is, if, if you are interested, if you are not on the Heterogeneity Alliance, right, we can, we can add your, your name, your, mailing, your, 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 your email address in, in, into, the, into the mailing list. And you can, again, you can, you can join, you can join the, the, uh, the discussions. And, and basically, yeah, but basically I am, yeah. We are represented oh, yeah, yeah. As, a, as a Hidalgo project, but um, I'm not taking a part because we are represented by Lara Lopez. But if you, yeah, if you may include also my name and uh, email, yeah, on the, on the mailing list, yeah, it would be appreciated. Not, not a problem. Drop me an email now so that I, I don't forget and I will do it soon after. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay. That's easy. So if, if again, if you are, if you have, if you have Lara on the uh, on the mailing list and and she and, and she's a, a, a attending the uh, the the uh, the monthly uh, the monthly uh, discussions and meetings mm -hmm, again, mm -hmm. we would announce at some point that we have not only agreed an overall structure of the book uh, and it, and the con and, and and the list of chapters that are uh, that that we are uh, that we are uh, uh, likely to have. But then we will we will need, of course, to invite the contributors. So yes, we will certainly keep you uh, in the in the loop. Okay, that's perfect. Shall you drop your email on on the chat? So I'll, yes, I'll... yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, here it okay, is. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, on the chat, uh, you could uh, let me just do this. Uh, let me just stop sharing. Right. In the chat, here it is. It is to all, all everyone. That's it. That's me. Drop in email okay. right now so that they so they would, I won't forget. We'll do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, guys. So uh Time to close this uh, workshop. It's been, uh, as usual, uh, a pleasure to uh, to to have you uh, to have you on board. Uh, I would like to thank all the uh, presenters, panelists, and and uh, our audience uh, for their uh, for the attendance and 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 also uh, 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 thank the, uh, the all the presenters for their uh, for their excellent uh, presentations. So. I, uh, again, if you are if you are interested in anything anything to do with the uh, with with the alliance itself, please uh, contact us. We have we have we have a website. We have, there is a form where we we would like to join and and these sort of things. And uh, and hopefully again we will see you again uh, at the next workshop. Thank you, Guardian. Thanks again. Bye. And, uh, Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank you for organizing. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.